Who got in after one? Oh, I love that. That was a beautiful unfurling there of your hand. And I, I did. Who got in after two? Okay. Who drank port? Sectively alcoholic. Oh, my God. Yeah. 
You have to be careful with that baby, don't you? Okay. You tell me when I can begin, when you are set up, Kimberly. When, yep, yeah, no, I shall wait. Welcome, everybody. Is there anybody new who's parachuted in today apart from the speakers? Is there anybody new in the audience who's just come in for today? No, you were all here. Okay. I was saying uh, to our lovely Spanish journalist, well, good luck with doing a resume of yesterday, <laughs> this morning. But he said, you know, I've got some free reign to be creative, so I think he's going to work his magic, come up with something eminently readable and engaging. No pressure, sir. Are your phones off? Sorry, on silent. Did anyone tweet last night? No? Oh, okay. Okay, let's try again. Who has started to fill out the evaluation form? You? Three? Three. Good. More than a line? It's getting underway? Okay, please do that. Please, please do that. You give me the okay when we're okay? Yeah, oh, we've still got some latecomers coming in. Okay. Are we good? Okay. So, good morning, everyone. Those of you here, I'm delighted to see you back, and those of you joining us online, welcome back, everyone, to this event entitled Democracy and Europe, Our Common Future organized by Net for Society and FCT, the Portuguese National Funding Agency for Science, Research and Technology. So, we all know what's what. Your phones are on silent. Everybody was here yesterday, apart from the speakers, and nobody tweeted. Very good. So, we've got two panel discussions today, separated by a 15-minute coffee break outside. Um, I just want to start us off by going over a couple of bits from yesterday, just a reminder, because they were very, very wide-ranging discussions, and I just want to pick out some of the key points as a reminder to pull them forward into our conversations today. Because we're going to focus in the first one really on Europe and democracy, and I'm going to say something on that and how I would like to endeavor to shape that discussion when we, when we kick it off. And then we really are looking at that link between research and innovation and policy making and the importance of facts and evidence and how all that feeds in and nourishes policy making and ultimately democracy. I just want to pick up on a couple of points and these are really not in any um, particular order, they are random. Some of the things that um, s sort of struck me or stood out for me yesterday, partly also because Kimberly, we were discussing this after over the cocktails, this issue of language. I think Julian started at the outset talking of the importance of language in the pure form of language that everybody understands and has access to the information before they vote, before they are able to make an informed decision, that there is that access. But we also talked about language. I think Katarzyna talked about it in a broader sense, that if you're going to talk to people, if you are going to elicit change, if you are going to understand them, if you are going to bring people into the democratic process, language in its much, much wider sense that is meaningful for them. Uh, we also looked at the importance of, I think, more than one person, that, that the vote, voting is seen as that most crucial and active part uh, of, of democracy, and, um, but there needs to be choice. And also, um, I think Marina at the outset was talking about we need a quality of participation. It needs to be strong and it needs to be diverse. Again, I thought what was interesting was Katarzyna talked about having access to awareness. So if we unpick it, you need to really uh, think about what everybody needs in terms of their understanding, in terms of their participation in the democratic process. They need to have access to awareness before you can even have those conversations. We had a very interesting question about can you have social citizenship based on rights, not obligations, which came in online. And we had um, also a question from, from inside the house on the, the crossover, the correlation. Is there a correlation between civil society and citizenship? And there was this comment, uh, forgive me if I'm paraphrasing somebody, um, that an active, an active civil society is what, fostered, is what fosters democracy. 
Um, there was the importance of the right to contest the wrong decision, which I think Bernard um, spoke about when he was talking about the different kinds of uh, democracy, the different kinds of engagement at the outset. Um, there was the very strong um, focus on socioeconomic equality and inclusion being right at the heart of democracy. That's what it is, not just because it's the right thing, but that because prosperous societies, in the broadest sense of the words, is the ones that function the best, that do well, and that the evidence seems to point to that's what people are actually saying they want, okay? And then thanks to the taxi driver, there can be no democracy without justice. Um, we did talk a little tiny bit about fake news. In fact, for you, I looked up what I was going to tell you when I was blundering along about the little app. It's called verymedia.org, verymedia.org. Uh, by a gentleman who's behind it called Hans van der Lue of the Institute for Integrated Economic Research. They have a browser and a plugin, but it goes way beyond just that. It's not just about naming and shaming, it's more about identifying good, solid, independent media, but that's what it's called. And then we had the point that money, money has too much power over democracy. We had some consensus around the value of the town square, getting people together, the value of face-to-face. And in the event that you can't and you need to spread it more broadly, the benefits of online, though actually eyeballing somebody obviously has been more benefits, but online also. Um, and I think, I think what, sorry, I'm going back a step. I'm being a little bit disorganized in my thinking, but something I wanted to just say off the back of when I was looking for you for the very media, how they um, actually posited it online was to say democracies only function if voters can make well-informed decisions. I was having a chat with our Spanish journalist uh, this morning, um, which is not the case if votes are bought by the people with the largest budget or to define their version of the truth. And that was somewhere where I think we ended up at the end, this difficulty about money having far too much power and people being able to buy democracy and use the trappings of democracy. So those are some of the issues. We're now going to go straight into our first session. Was there anything, sorry, anything anybody wanted to add that they had been cogitating about overnight over the port? All happy, broadly? I know I've missed out loads, but there's just some of the key points. We're good to go? So the first session is democracy in Europe and beyond. What role for the EU? So what role for the EU with its member states? What role for the EU in the wider world? Um, it is a core principle of the EU. It shaped the history and it guides the EU's relations with the rest of the world. Um, what's important in this discussion is to look at also how the EU is responding to what is happening within democracy, the changes, the rise in populism, all of these stresses that are coming both from the inside and coming from the outside. So what are the challenges that we have been discussing? Um, what are the, how are they impacting on the EU's understanding and support of democracy? And how is this understanding impacting on the EU's role in the world? I want to just have a request on this one, if I may. And I'm not on a, you know, I have my criticisms of the EU. I'm totally, you know, here's me. I'm very balanced in what I think. But I would ask on this one, this is not to just go into a, let's bash the EU, what it does or doesn't do with its member states. Fine, if that's a bit of that. But there are so many of those discussions at the moment, this is not the purpose of it. So what I'm going to ask you is to keep bringing the discussion back down to really how does the EU, what is the role it plays, where is it doing, where is it doing well, where is it not doing well, where is it outmoded, where does it need to change? We looked at a lot of that yesterday when we said the challenges with member states who are making it complicated for citizens on the ground because of their relationship with the EU. So I would like to think of it a bit more broadly, if I may. Okay, so that is where I'm going to try and keep the focus of these discussions. Not just what the EU is doing wrong, we have a lot of conversation about that at the moment, a lot of things about where and how and will it be reformed. But something more broad, please. Okay, so first of all, let us um, welcome the people who are coming here to stir up your brains. We have got a very warm round of applause, Björn Vinden, who is Director for the Centre for Welfare and Labour Research. Where are you, Björn? If you, you may come now. A warm round of applause in Norway. Balash Dennis, who is Director of Civil Liberties Union for Europe. Please come. Yes, you may not just wave, you may actually ascend to the stage. And Maria Raquel Freire, who is the Jean Monnet Chair, EU External Relations towards the East from the University of Coimbra, Portugal. So, a warm round of applause. Can we do a Slido question? Are you guys set up on Slido? Are we good to go? Yep, 
Okay, so if you can bring up the first question, which I hope will be the one I have here, how can more open government be achieved? Do we have that? Do you have that? We may not see it. How can open government be achieved? More disclosure access to information, less media coverage, greater public debate or public involvement through consultation, online, in squares, sitting quietly and listening. Okay, the philosophers would have something to say about that, I think. Okay. So if you tell me when you're done, you're all good? You voted? You've made your choice? Okay. Okay, so um, it's a bit of a big one. So I hope this is the thrust of what, what you've prepared. It may well not be. But what I am going to ask you is, um, what does democracy in Europe mean for you? What are your expectations of it? What's your understanding of it? What's your experience? I'm starting off with the very personal. How do you live it? And what do you expect from it? Can I start with you, sir? Um, actually, I am prepared uh, to say uh, more uh, about it. And, and very briefly, I, I think uh, the core is that um, the three things that the European Union needs to, to fulfill in terms of being democratic. First, that people see opportunities for actually participating directly or indirectly in giving policies and the persons who are implementing policies. Mm -hmm. I mean, the participation is essential. Second, that people feel that um, these policies uh, that they have supported really make a positive difference. Okay. Ah, yeah. Sorry, thank yeah. you for doing my job for me. Yes, go on. You should be okay, you should be on. Have a try. No, it doesn't work. Can you send, there was yeah. only one functioning yesterday. Let's see if it's this one. Here, give me that one. Yeah. So, yes, and just to repeat, um, I think there are three important elements for any claim that the European Union is democratic. And first, it must allow people to participate in meaningful ways. Second, um, th this participation must be felt to give make a difference uh, in a positive way. And third, people must be confident that um, there is sort of business development takes place in a proper way, mm -hmm. in an accountable, understandable, uh, incorrupt, etc. way. Mm -hmm. That I think mm -hmm. is basically the core. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, during this panel, I will actually like to, uh, during the, the discussion my, with my colleagues and, and the audience really, sort of spell out a bit more about what, what this involved. And I will also question really whether there is that much difference between um, the democracy at national level and the one we see at European level. Mm -hmm. And that those two are certainly very much interrelated. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Wow, that was very good, because you know, your last thing, I think that's an excellent, and I'm very delighted that you want to explore that, whether democracy is different, because I was thinking, right, when he's finished speaking, I'm going to ask him exactly that. You talked about the opportunity to feed into policy, crucially in a meaningful way, yes, making a difference. So what is the outcome of the feeding in? Does it make a difference? And that totally the business of government is correct. So then you said, OK, we're going to look at if there is a difference. So here is my question to you. Are the expectations, do you think, of people on what the EU should be doing and their own national uh, government, whether it is in the business of government or making a difference, do you think... There are higher expectations of the EU because there is less access, there is less understanding, it's more remote, and in certain member states, they are also not bringing that understanding out there to their citizens. Do you think there's... I, I think you point to essential things. Um, I think it's very clear um, that for most, most of us, it's very hard to understand what goes on on the European level, and, and that's the basic barrier for appreciation of what we get out of it. Second, I think also, you, as you suggest, that um, policies at national level are, to a great extent, to bl be blamed for not really um, informing their voters and, and the citizenship about what their country 
and its voters really gain from being part of the EU or related to the EU as we are in Norway. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there, we say, uh, and I think it's some truth in that there are a lot of politicians we see that blame the EU if um, they have to do something that voters don't like, and they take the credit if they do something where the EU also has a role, they take the credit for that themselves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that sort of gives the EU sort of less sort of leverage in sort of getting credit for what they are actually doing. Mm -hmm. And, and um, in my view, often good things, not only bad things that I think have been highlighted very much yesterday. Okay, we'll hold that thought because I think it's important also to keep a link when we talk about EU and democracy and how it is responding to the challenges. I think it's important because I like to get to the concrete and when you say absolutely people feel more re remote and perhaps national governments in certain cases are not doing enough to bring the information out there, what can we do to change this concretely? I mean, but we'll park that for a second. Can I, thank you very much. Um, can I come to you please, Valash? And uh, were you going to answer the question I posited or were you going to go somewhere else with this uh, introduction? We will see. Okay, right. go for it. So I'm a human rights activist, so it's okay. really difficult for yeah. me to uh, see things from a different perspective. But to answer your original question, to me, democracy means basically three things. First, transparency. Second, accountability. And third, participation. Uh, and uh, I like to uh, always to bring concrete examples from the work what we are doing. Uh, and on the uh, transparency part, here I'm talking about lawmaking. And I know this is a very complicated topic, and uh, I don't want to uh, paint, I don't want to present that everything is black and white. But the, f the truth is that at the moment, the way how EU creates laws is extremely complicated. That's one thing. You know, it, it takes it takes uh, mm -hmm. uh, difficult measures to uh, put everyone on the, on the table and, uh, and all that. But uh, the problem here is the lack of uh, transparency during the lawmaking uh, process. And this is not uh, my opinion. The um, the European Ombudsman two years ago declared that uh, within the, uh, uh, in the trilogue process as uh, the European Commission, the Parliament and the Council uh, uh, is, is getting closer around certain proposals uh, is untransparent at the moment. And uh, the, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, you know if, if I want to bring a concrete example, at the very moment uh, we are in the middle of creating a new uh, directive on the uh, copyright uh, issues. It's called the Copyright Directive for the Digital Single Market. Thank you, I'm sorry. Uh, and here, what I see is, uh, is, is, is a really strange and frustrated repetition of what we have seen with the Data Retention Directive. A few years ago, the EU created the Data Retention Directive, and despite uh, all the uh, uh, critics and, and, and very comments of human rights defenders and all those uh, dealing with uh, data protection, the directive was adopted. The directive was followed by a series of national laws, uh, which after they come into effect, were uh, what, one by one were attacked by uh, uh, human rights defenders and national uh, constitutional courts. The result, a few years after the creation, the European uh, Court of Justice uh, struck down the, the, data protection, the data retention directive. And a very similar example is now repeated with the copyright directive. The uh, process is going on for one year now, despite the concerns of human rights defenders, academics, all experts, human rights, uh, copyright uh, uh, um, community, we don't get answers how the uh, very problematic parts of the copyright directive will be removed from the text. We have no idea what's going on. All we have is leaked out information. What I'm saying here, because we compared with the, uh, you know, the uh, national, what happened at the national level and the EU level, I'm saying that I think in most EU member states it would be impossible uh, to uh, see a solution, see a proposal coming from a national parliament and the national government and maybe from uh, the specialized authority and, and that document being not accessible for the public. That's not the level of transparency most voters uh, expect at the national mm -hmm. level. And, uh, and, and if you see it from uh, this perspective, it's no wonder that people don't really feel the ownership uh, 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 of the union. So that's on uh, transparency. Mm -hmm. On accountability, I, I know my time is limited and I don't want to open Pandora's box. Uh, but what we've seen a uh, few weeks ago in Spain, Catalonia, and I'm not using the word referendum because I don't want to go uh, into that debate, but the, uh, the way how Spanish police reacted uh, 
uh, uh, to the situation. According to uh, uh, global and European human rights organizations, was really unproportionate, and probably we have seen the worst uh, police abuses in the history of uh, the EU. What's the reaction of EU institutions to that uh, situation? Well, so far I've seen only two uh, uh, remarks. The first was coming from Vice President uh, uh, Timmermans, uh, when he uh, told something uh, in the European uh, Parliament, actually, which was a very uh, 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 you know, careful uh, uh, definition of, uh, of uh, uh, proportionate uh, police uh, uh, force use. Uh, but at the end of the day, 10 out of 10 media outlets, uh, uh, magazines, and journals understood his remarks as an approval of the actions of the uh, Spanish police. Mm -hmm. So that's, that was the first mm -hmm. thing. And the second thing I saw mm -hmm. from, the, from the director of the Fundamental Rights Agency, the EU's specialized uh, human rights and civil liberties agency on this issue, and his answer was that because of our mandate, because of our limited mandate, we simply cannot comment the situation. Mm -hmm. Now, if you ask me, I mean, I understand the problems with the limited, limited mandate of the uh, Fundamental Rights Agency, and I understand uh, Mr. Timmermans has to uh, very carefully balance his opinion. But if you see this from uh, the voters' perspective, from the citizens' perspective, mm -hmm. if you see these things in the media, and these are the only two reactions people got from the EU, that's not exactly mm -hmm. what we paid, what we would take from, from, from the EU. Okay. okay, and you were going to talk of participation, or, not, or was sure, that uh, just sure, in a I mean, nutshell? Yeah. I, I think the EU is, is, is doing a, a lot of things to uh, ensure citizens' participation. And I very much welcome uh, the, the, uh, the Commission's president to uh, announce that there will be a reform of the European Citizens' Initiative. Uh, mm -hmm. But don't get me wrong. I don't think we should blame the EU and the Commission for everything and every failure in participation. I, I believe that European NGOs, human rights NGOs, but also other NGOs, have tremendous responsibility of not using the ECI as, uh, as they could in the past. The fact that there were really low number of ECIs, and even lower number of ECIs, which, which actually were able to collect a million signatures, is not the fault of the system, it's not the responsibility of the commissioners. So there is responsibility of civil society, and what you are, as you started your uh, remark this morning, an active and vivid civil society is really the backbone of any democratic uh, institution, uh, let it be at the national or at the supranational level. And I'm not sure for civil society organizations are fully capitalizing on the existing uh, opportunity. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, I'll just pick up on one thing you say because we're coming, so we very different, you know, perspectives, very, very important. One thing particular, talking about and um, the transparency, and you're saying, you know, there we were, you know, we've got all these voices. I've heard it in other sectors. You know, there we were. I've heard it recently. We were talking about oceans, the problems with oceans, deep sea mining. And I had somebody on my panel, you know, researcher saying, we've been giving this information, you need, you know, and it's being ignored. So this is coming up again and again and again. So I just wonder what your um, very briefly response is. There was a lady yesterday we spoke to from Germany saying, sometimes the commission takes the hit a lot, but don't forget it's the it's in the council and it's you know who are negotiating at member state level and that's where it sits and on behalf of their citizens they are part of the process and we need to remember that where are you still in here the lady who we there we are so i'm paraphrasing you but you know please be think about where the process is and the member states sitting around the table and what they agree with so you're there your voices are there you come there you say they're ignored where do you see national government sitting in this in their negotiations of those big issues and then what proliferates afterwards so you you say the eu is at fault there for this you know it happened before it's happening again where do you see national government no there? no no don't get me wrong most of the crap is usually coming from national governments right so did you sorry did you just say most of the crap is you, i didn't hear you very I, I well did, okay I did, I did. right right I, I do believe that most of the, most of the problematic proposals are actually coming usually from, uh, from, from, from government. Uh, the problem is the lack of transparency, knowing which government is behind what, mm -hmm. which are the unsympathetic government, mm -hmm. which are the governments which will be willing to resist mm -hmm. problematic uh, legislation. You know, somehow I feel mm -hmm. that between the national and the mm -hmm. EU level, we are uh, losing uh, uh, transparency and we are okay. also losing, I'm sorry to say, the, uh, you know, all this is happening from taxpayers' money principle. 
uh, you know, national, uh, at the national level, most politicians and political parties simply would not be in the, uh, in the situation to allow themselves uh, not to talk openly about okay. ongoing uh, pieces of legislation. And at EU level, it's possible. Okay. Uh, yes. all, in the, all in the name of, uh, you know, uh, of coordinated action and, 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 and compromises. Okay. All right. You need to hold your mic a bit closer because it makes a huge difference for, the, for these people. I will also, I think, um, what's important, and we can perhaps bear that in mind for the discussion, the point you make, I think the valuable point is, and it, it's something I think about a lot, what is that relationship between the EU and its member states? You say, Timmerman says two things, I don't have a mandate, it proliferates. So what is that relationship? What should it be? And perhaps that's something I can come back and, 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 and in fact, let me just hold, hold that thought. You, can you come back on that? What is that relationship? Stephen says it's not our mandate. So that seems to be problematic, people understanding what the relationship is and sometimes wanting the EU to do more, and it's not. And we talked about expectations. What is that relationship? Where is it vulnerable? Could it be improved? Yes. Uh, <clears throat> I agree with my colleague here that obviously um, especially the role of the Commission is rather tricky. And um, um, moreover, it's also very clear in many cases that the Commission don't speak with one voice. I mean, uh, uh, the GUGs on the finance side say very different things than the, the people on the social policy side, for instance. Um, I, I think um, uh, the Commission is a result, the power of the Commission is, is a result of, in my view, of a more fundamental problem that um, from long time back, um, despite of the Rome treaties um, talk about a sort of ever closer union, there are constantly been a reluctance by, especially from some member states, really to go along that and, and want to retain uh, the EU as uh, some sort of intergovernmental or international organization, but not a union, not a confederation. And that uh, means that um, um, there is a, a ambiguity on that I think your example also illustrates between what really should be uh, um, the president of the council and not the, pre not the vice president or president of the commission who should make statements about. Um, because as we are all aware, it is the council that has the final decisions together with the parliament. It's not the commission. Okay, and let, thank you. I will come to you in a minute, Kimberly. I'd like to hear the last speaker. Just, and again, so we've talked a lot about, okay, where the vulnerabilities are, where what we feel is, is not working, what we feel is. I want to just again, and for my own self, to make sure we also stick to the EU and its response to the democratic process changing, to democracy changing, to the stresses it has. So it's got this vulnerable relationship with its member states, and, that, and it's got this rise in population, it's got the economic crisis, it's got migration. So how should it be shaping itself in terms of you know, its role, you know, its big champion for democracy? How, how should it be doing that with the rest of the world? Let's just bear that in mind. Can I ask you the same question that I say? It may be, I don't know if you've answered it, what is your experience? What do you expect from the EU in terms of democracy? What is your experience of democracy as you live it in Europe? Um, not to repeat, let's say, because I agree with this uh, inclusive yeah. definition of democracy that is being put on the table in terms of accountability, representation, uh, participation, choice, all these things that we associate usually with democracy. Uh, but to put it a bit in perspective and maybe bring a little bit of a more positive uh, input to, to the discussion, because of course we all recognize these, these limits, but as in my work I deal a lot with uh, the partners to the East and Russia, so the EU relations towards this area, what we see is that uh, the socialization processes regarding democracy in this, uh, in this uh, area is quite uh, complex. And the understandings about democracy are not exactly the same understandings we have within the, the European Union. And so, uh, to a large extent, the EU has been putting forward uh, very clearly this concept about deep democracy, 
which involves all these uh, concepts we've been talking about, whereas we are still dealing a lot with what has been called surface democracy in many of these, uh, of these states. For some, there is a very narrow interpretation of democracy. Democracy is basically holding elections. And this is, of course, not how we see uh, democracy within the European Union. And so there is, to some extent, uh, very technical, if we want, understandings about what democracy means. And this gives a lot of leeway to political elites to put forward not really democratic uh, principles, procedures, uh, whatever, but within this legitimizing label of uh, being uh, a democracy. And I think this is uh, somehow a big challenge for the EU on how uh, it can better socialize uh, its own principles. The problem now, and it has already been uh, underlined here, is that somehow this is backlashing within the EU in the sense that where is really deep democracy within the EU when we see some of its member states and some examples were already uh, given here, mentioned here, where we see some retreat, let's say, in terms of the implementation of some of these democratic principles. So this is something we have to, to it's a challenge we are all facing within, and of course it has implications towards um, the outside also, and in the way we try to project our own model, let mm -hmm. me put it. Do you think that um, because of this challenge, I mean, we had um, a question yesterday in the audience uh, to Katarzyna about Poland saying, you know, when the EU is going to make a criticism of Poland, where, what's, is it good, is it, what is it, what, what does that mean, what's the impact of that? Um, so we talk about the difficulty to use a challenge, if we look at how people perceive it from a global perspective, who are not inside, um, do you think that is undermining? how the EU is perceived in the world. As in, oh, it doesn't seem to be getting itself together on migration. Oh, look at, I mean, the economic crisis was global, but, you know, oh, some member states, there's not, you know, they can see there's a rise in populism in some member states. So do you think that is altering the perception? I mean, we already know broadly what Trump thinks, but wider beyond the United States. Uh, definitely, I would say yes. It's uh, altering the perceptions uh of the EU in global terms. If I can give an extreme example, the way Russia has been playing uh, uh, with relations with uh, the EU, the way it has been using in, using in its discourse, how the rise of populism, for example, within Europe, how Brexit is showing this decadent, let's say, Western uh, civilization, etc. So it says, for example, in the case of Russia, become very much part of the critical discourse on the, on the EU. And so to some extent, some of these developments might be uh, manipulated uh, in discourse from some of the, of the neighbors, in particular Russia. But this does, not, this does not mean, of course, that all the criticism and uh, this Russian narrative is exactly mirroring what is going on mm -hmm. within the EU, naturally. So we have to be kind of careful in the way, uh, in the way we deal with this. But that there is a trend to explore somehow uh, some of these, uh, of these issues uh, that I think is becoming a bit more clear. Okay. And of course, policies of destabilization can affect the way the EU is dealing with, uh, with these issues. But I, I try to be a little bit positive in terms of some of the effects from the, the financial crisis, Brexit, etc., on how the EU might uh, and sh should try to find more convergence within. And I think we have some windows of opportunity in terms of uh, looking forward in a more uh, a united way, if I can put it uh, in, in these words. When the, the global strategy was adopted in 2016, I think this became very clear that there is this need for a more uh, united, coherent uh, EU, building on its normative core principles where democracy mm -hmm. is always there, and uh, uh, as a way also to strengthen the EU in its external relations. Okay. 
Let me just ask, and I will open it to the floor, I promise, but I just, from picking up from what you're saying, if I can ask you a question also from, from sort of civil liberties and um, perspective. Yesterday, I mean, so you've just said it yourself, you know, one of the emblematic uh, symbols of the EU is, this, is democracy, stands for certain values. So that's important. Yesterday, when we were here, we explored that democracy is also about dignity. And, and, and solidarity also comes out dignity and also socioeconomic equality. So um, looking not just on the negatives, the positives, let's look at both sides. Do you think the EU, if it's saying, here's one of the symbols is democracy, and people's understanding of democracy is also about giving everybody dignity, giving that socioeconomic equality, do you think the EU is uh, living up to that promise in people's minds from that perspective? Um, um based in Germany and work in Germany, but I'm also Hungarian. So uh, I think t to answer that question, I think the EU does extremely, uh, like, like uh, incredibly lot uh, and tremendous effort uh, uh, to deliver those uh, uh, promises, especially in the uh, phase when countries are joining, are about to join uh, the Union. Uh, there is tremendous hope a lot of promises, also uh, extreme amount of work in terms of harmonizing the legal system mm -hmm. and, 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 uh, and all that. But since the union is based on a bona fide cooperation of, uh, of equal countries, at the very moment when uh, a member state becomes uh, a full right member of the EU, the tools to intervene in that country uh, the tools to oh, intervene so in the country. Better, so much better. You can hold it lower, then they can see your face. So, the suddenly. Uh, <laughs> suddenly uh, became rather limited. Uh, and again, I don't want to uh, sound monomaniac, uh, but just can we just ask ourselves a question? What would have been the EU's reaction if the police abuse, what we've seen in Spain three weeks ago, would have happened in a member, in a, in a candidate uh, country or, uh, you know, in a country which one day hope uh, to, to hope to join uh, the EU. I think the amount of reaction from EU institutions and officials would have been you know, much stronger and, uh, and, 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 and the union and, and the, uh, the institutions would have been seen as guardians of uh, uh, rights and, and liberties. Once you are a member, and we see that very well with Poland and Hungary, uh, you know, those tools are rather limited. I think, and it also comes back to, I think, this question of mandate, because I've heard this also actually from Croatia, a young person in Croatia echoing what you say on a, on a panel recently about so much was done, the government was really going home, and now I can see things sliding, and where's the AU saying? And the lady from DG Enlargement saying, it's not our mandate. Yep, yeah, have you? Yes. Yeah, <clears throat> I think this is a very important point, and uh, I, would like, I would like to highlight that... Um, one of the things that the EU actually has achieved, um, uh, even at the resistance of uh, some member states, is really to strengthen the legal protection against discrimination. And also, uh, um, on, on, a, on a range of different bases, uh, not only gender, that is basic, but also on ethnicity, sexuality, age, etc. And, and um, it's quite clear that some current member states would not have been allowed to become members if they had sort of refused to accept uh, these um, directives. And, and uh, uh, so in that sense, I think that's essential. But moreover, I think one also has to add that um, there is a system for litigation. There, it is possible to present a claim or file a claim that you have been discriminated against on some of these bases. And, and um, that, can, that is not something that the member state can prevent you from doing. So I think um, uh, to the extent that the EU in this area and also through the European Court of Justice actually can do something uh, positive, not only stop things as uh, illustrated by my Okay, thank you. So can I throw it open to the floor for some thoughts? Short ones, nice or some questions or thoughts about that. What are your expectations of the EU? Do you see it as a symbol for democracy? You feel you're happy? How do you expect it to behave on the world stage? Do you have a view 
on when it comments on very challenging, difficult times, like the situation with Spain at the moment, or when a country is acceded and then it's in. I'm just going to see if it just says any. Yeah, yeah. No, no, no. You're you're fine. Let me just see. Well, you may break the ice. Hang on. Where do we? Where do we? Do we have a yes? Here on the front row, please. Thank you. And then Kimberly, I don't know if you've got anything coming in online yet. If anyone's awake. <laughs> now that's funny. Okay. Okay. Um, yeah. First of all, I wanted to say that absolutely, I think that um, there has to be really clear and uh, condemnation of. Uh, police brutality and government mandated police brutality against EU citizens who are peacefully protesting or expressing their opinions, whether that's in Catalonia or anywhere else. Um, but I also wanted to point out that oftentimes when we see this sort of very um, visible physical violence, uh, we get outraged. But what we're less aware of and what we should be really paying attention to is the curtailment of legal rights to freedom of expression, to the right to protest, to freedom of assembly. In Spain, for example, we've had the reform of the uh, penal code, which has significantly restricted the rights to protest, and it has significantly increased the cost. And it's using a whole system of legal and administrative reforms to silence critique. And it's directly in response to people mobilizing in the streets against what they perceive to be illegitimate actions of their government and corruption and deep corruption of the government. So the EU also needs to, to take a stand against this kind of behavior in their member states when it's not, it's not just somebody saying this, this is the, you know, the United Nations uh, rapporteurs for human rights are writing reports and calling attention to this. And the EU cannot be silent when international organizations and their own organizations are saying this is a problem. So just to flag that up, that of course police brutality is always the most naked and visible expression of, of repression, but we have to also be aware of the legal mechanisms that are used to try to silence what are political issues. And we need, for democracy, we need to have political solutions to political problems and not legal and judicial mm -hmm. um, Mm -hmm. recurring to actually sort what needs to be sorted out through through dialogue and participation and listening to people. So just was a comment. Okay. Okay. And, oh, and just Thanks. one quick question. What is an ECI? ECI is called the um, European, it stands for the European Citizens Initiative. Okay. And that's, okay. that's um, it's a relatively easy tool provided by the EU uh, for citizens or a group of citizens to influence decision making, to oh. put certain issues on the agenda. It was introduced a few years ago, and it's, as I said, it's relatively easy. Uh, uh, you need to collect uh, a million signatures from at least seven countries in, a, in, a, in, a, in about 12 months, uh, but extremely low number of successful ECIs were, were happened. Uh, as far as I know, there were 50 uh, initiatives, and only four of them uh, made, it, uh, uh, made it to the uh, uh, one million limit. The elephant in the room, though, I have to tell you, with, regarding ECI, is that what happens if an ECI actually contradicts ongoing legislation at the EU, and we are actually in the middle uh, of a conflict of, exactly of uh, this kind, because one, of, uh, one very successful ECI uh, 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 happened uh, just, uh, just this uh, summer uh, about banning uh, a certain substance, uh, the use of certain substance in, in the EU, uh, but the EU is about to adopt legislation which uh, would allow to use that uh, chemical for another 10 years. So that's an extremely interesting question. What I was referring to is that I don't think it's the sole responsibility of the European Commission that civil society organizations are not capitalizing on this possibility. Okay. Anyone Thank else you. who's got a... Okay, come to Katarzyna. Yeah. Yes. Thank you. No. Uh, the, yeah. Um, okay, so I have first two comments. So one to, to what my colleague said uh, about the... Do you want uh, to stand just so people can see you? I think it's nice. Do you mind? Thank you. Sorry. No, no I'm worries. Ready for this, Go on. No worries, no worries. Just so that they uh, not, don't hear a disembodied voice. Yes, so uh, one about the mechanism how to tackle the legal pressure. And uh, again, uh, my country is a great example because we are so far with <laughs> all the development. So I think we can be 
a good um, a good proof of how also the mechanism that Commission or EU has does not really work even if you use them and you have them. So like even like the more far-fetched uh, Article 7 uh, threat that, that is already like a high level of course. Uh, if your government uh, doesn't want to listen and there is a political also game uh, you know in the fractions in the parliament and so on uh, the question is always about being efficient about this mechanism after all and you know I mean it's important to have them but again it's important to be also realistic about how to use them and is it the more efficient tool which I cannot answer now because I have no alternatives to offer to anyone but I just want to bring this mm -hmm. uh, also into uh, into light and about the capitalizing um, so I think you're right but um, first uh, we have the programs and we have initiatives for civil society as democracy is a healthy state. That's how I see this when I analyze them. Uh, because I, as I mentioned yesterday, I don't know where you're here or not, I worked with the uh, programs uh, since, uh, I don't know, 10 years in different organizations and definitely I'm a proof how we can improve you and many people. But now, since two years, I'm uh, uh, active for Poland and now the, dif this, the difference is that when the uh, the programs and the policies and the offer was prepared for when we are okay, more or less. But when the country or democracy is in danger, we have emergency state in some sense. And in this moment, all how I found it, because I look into this a lot, because I knew there is a good, a lot of good things there. It was just not enough, and the procedures and all the conditions that were around that were just impossible to apply this. So, for example, if you have very well, okay, yeah. sorry, developed a civil society organization when you have professionals working in it that yeah. are already aware, this is perfect. And you're right, maybe we should, you know, be more active and not blame everything on commission. But when you are having grassroots movements that are more and more in Europe, that don't have even the skills, they don't even know, sorry, where the website is yeah. and what you're talking about, this is the question, uh, how to bridge this and okay. how to give them uh, the conditions that they can to use. To be able to. Okay, it's to do important. more uptake. It's okay, keep it stuff. nice and, yep. Can you, you wanted to come just, in here. Just really short, and that was what I meant when I said the EU is based on the bona fide cooperation of, uh, of, of countries. When, when something is going wrong in a member state, when rule of law is in, in danger, at the moment we lack strong mechanism by the EU to warn, to act, or to I mean, properly react. There could be things uh, to consider. There is such a thing as the European Endowment for Democracy, which, uh, which is, which is a, an institution uh, to protect rule of law and strengthen rule of law in the neighboring uh, countries. What could prevent us to set up a similar uh, endowment uh, for protecting rights within the EU? What could prevent us to broaden the mandate of the Fundamental Rights Agency and make that institution ready and able to act and react when something wrong is going on member states. You were absolutely right with the, uh, with the gag law and the criminal code modification in Spain. The uh, Catalonia police violence did not happen out of the blue. It, it, it has uh, you know, long and, and, and historical root causes. But if we have an agency at the EU which deals with fundamental rights, which ma whose mandate is simply not making able this institution to examine, monitor, report, and comment about these kind of abuses, then that institution won't be able to fulfill its mission. So, you know, there could be many things uh, which could be done uh, to protect rule of law and, and rights of citizens within the EU. And, uh, you know, these are, not, uh, these are not very complicated things, I think. I'm going to come at, thank you. Um, I'm going to just, oh, you want to come back? Okay, keep it nice, because then I'm going to ask you a question. Yes. Yeah, can I just, um, because it was really interesting when you were talking about uh, some of these developments that we have been witnessing these last weeks, like uh, police brutality in demonstrations, the curtailment of legal rights, let's add corruption to these, and we have what we usually come up when we are talking about the Eastern neighborhood partners. It's really interesting how we are discussing about the EU, many of the problems we have been identifying in the, since the neighborhood policy and the Eastern Partnership were put in place regarding how to deal uh, with these issues in our neighborhood. Because the idea has always been to create this ring of friends around the EU 
where we could then uh, promote, let's say, or create this ring of friends through the promotion of these values that we so much value, uh, let's say. And in the end, what we have now around us is very much, as has been said, a ring of fire more than a ring of friends. And look at what is going on, for example, in Ukraine and how the U.S. has been trying to, to, to cope what is going on there. And the challenges are enormous. And despite the signature of the association agreement, for example, trying to give something more and to give an incentive, and incentives here are, of course, important, uh, the, the, the situation is not at all um, promising, let's say, at the moment. And so it's interesting to see, uh, to, some, uh, to some extent, how the overall context and this issue about capabilities and expectations that you raised up immediately at the beginning is so, so important in terms of how the EU mm -hmm. plays. So just, thank you. And, and to put, uh, just, um, do wave if you want to come in, Kimberly, with anything. Yeah, something that's not just your own. But you can ask your own as well. I mean, did you want to ask your... Do you want to read the own question that you typed into your own phone out to us? <laughs> yeah. And I was just wondering if you could maybe elaborate a bit on that. What exactly is deep democracy? Yeah, sure. In terms of um, how this has been uh, this has been conceptualized and looking at uh, the neighborhood, it's kind of a more recent concept in the sense that what the the annual reviews, let's say, of how the policies were being implementing policies directed at reform. Uh, were being implementing in many of the partner countries were saying or were showing that in terms of uh, issues like corruption or effective participation of civil society they were all, they were still lagging a lot behind and uh, the conclusion somehow and there is this acknowledgement from the EU was that uh, there was a lot of superficial democracy going on so the local elites to some extent adopting some of the technical procedures because we have to do this like that and this, that like that, whatever, but not really engaging and enrooting. And below the surface, a lot of corruption is still going on and a lot of, um, of these, let's say, <laughs> not, not really democratic procedures are, are in place. And this, this, this change and this uh, underlining of the EU about the need for deep democracy has a lot to do with the need to cut the surface and really deal with the problems that are underlining it and not allowing, let's say, more um, democratic regimes to be built. It's something that is interesting in this discussion is, of course, the political will to, to do this. Of course, there are a lot of issues um, here, but for example, if we look at uh, global transparency indexes and you look at Georgia, Georgia that clearly wants so much to get close to EU institution has been doing a fantastic job in terms of dealing with these uh, deeper issues. Of course, with still many problems, but. Uh, but if you look at many other countries in this area, the I can give several examples, Azerbaijan, for example, or even Ukraine, which is struggling a lot, there are still, you know, uh, long ways to go before some of these uh, deep democracy in this sense of being inclusive, participatory, where you can choose, where you are accountable, where you are responsible. Uh, dignity, you know, all these issues that we include in our understanding of uh, democracy and of deep democracy will take time. And uh, the, the EU is now making a bigger effort, and this has become very clear in the last review of the neighborhood policy, in terms of engaging more with civil society organizations, with uh, mm -hmm. these social, let's say, um, actors that might help in terms of really in rooting these democratic principles in this sense, with many challenges. Okay, yes. Really yeah. two sentences yeah. on this deep democracy thing. I, mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's very sad, but it's true. It's much easier to change laws and the legal environment 
than people's thinking, mentality, or behavior. Mm -hmm. And uh, that's why it's so sad that the EU is not fully using the accession processes, uh, the, the, the opportunities the accession process uh, uh, are offering after the accession. Uh, just before the uh, 10 new countries joined the EU in 2004, uh, as far as I know, but I'm definitely sure about Hungary, there were really wide, visible, and pretty effective anti-discrimination education campaigns in, in, in these countries. In the case of Hungary, that, you know, that meant campaigns uh, to, uh, uh, to, uh, to reduce the discrimination of the, uh, of the Roma uh, uh, Hungarians. As at the very moment when the country joined the EU, all those campaigns were stopped because the <laughs> presumption was that now you are a full right member of the EU, now you are a developed country, so you, know, you need to work uh, uh, on these things on, on your own. Unfortunately, that's not the, the case. You know, and the same is true for uh, uh, same is true for uh, many many marginalized uh, communities. It's very easy to change the legal environment, but people's behavior and mentality won't change from that. Mm -hmm. You wanted to come? Yeah. Yes. Um, I, I think this um, discussion is very interesting, but um, um, especially what you suggest, Balash, that one could um, sort of imagine that the EU uh, sort of reacted uh, also towards um, current member states when there are cases of uh, sort of breach of basic human rights in the way th that we do in relation to non-member states or candidate countries. Uh, in one way, I have a sympathy for that. But on the other hand, I think we are in a climate now with Brexit and uh, other countries uh, where perhaps are also considering that option, where I think what you suggest could actually mean that some of the sort of perpetrators here see a good, good excuse for doing a Brexit, in the sense that um, I think, um, uh, as far as I understand, uh, it, that the EU is in one sense balancing on, on um, an edge here where if it sort of um, expands its role in along the way you suggest uh, that again I in principle support I think actually the tensions within the EU uh, on the, in in the council and between the member state will increase and not decrease and uh, I, I think uh, as we know brexit we haven't talked very much about brexit but I think actually brexit is a very important symptom that there is in, I think not only in, in the UK, but in, also in other countries, a feeling that um, the EU, uh, whatever they mean by that, the EU decides too much. Thank you. Uh, yeah, the, yeah. the beauty of uh, being uh, an activist, I don't want to sound more cynical than I am, is that you, you know, I don't necessarily have to know the uh, solutions, right? So it's, it's uh, you know, I'm, it's, it's uh, uh, sometimes enough to identify uh, the problem. But without uh, uh, joking, I think I find it extremely interesting that the two countries where the population or the voters' uh, biggest proportion uh, supports the EU membership at the moment are Poland and Hungary. If you, you know, if you see the Eurobarometer data, in which countries people support the most the notion of being a member in the EU, that's actually Poland and Hungary, the two countries where current governments are making everything possible uh, to, uh, to fight with the EU and to charge the EU uh, with, 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 with all bad things. Despite that, and despite that, that these governments are actually winning elections in these countries, uh, there is tremendous support uh, for the Union, and people don't want to believe that their countries can be kicked out from the Union. And that gives some leverage. Uh, uh, when you think about, you know, how strongly the EU uh, could and should react in these situations. Well, um, I, I certainly see your point, but at the same time, um, I'm not completely convinced. Uh, I think that um, uh, even if, um, as you say, opinion polls uh, suppose, uh, so, so suggest a uh, high popular support for the EU, um, I mean, we know that the majority of people don't not necessarily translate into um, a, a strong support for a government that's sharing that view. 
And actually, I think what, at least from far away, I'm not, you are closer to this than I am, but both what happening has happened in, in Hungary for quite a while and now seems to have happened in Poland. Again, some of you know much more about also that. So me, it suggests that the EU is not really able to sanction this and, and that the, the leaders, current leaders are still pressing uh, sort of the issue to the point where it almost sort of the EU loses its credibility. Yeah, I would like to because I think I want to just kind of rein in and recap a little bit on where we are because I think what we, we get to to an extent a nub of something which is what is you know in this in, in a democracy what is with the EU championing it as one of its core principles um, what is the EU's role towards its member states should we have as you propose if I forgive me if I you know a broader function of the fundamental rights agency for example should the EU speak out more if it does does it lose its credibility do member states turn around and just go sod off or at the next opportunity, do they whinge if the EU doesn't get involved enough? So this is, I think, for me, within this whole of the EU and democracy and the changes and the changes that are happening at national level, to what extent, what is its role? How strong can it be? How swaggering can it be? How vocal can it be? How does it get coherence among its member states so that the responses to some of these the big stuff that's happening at the moment in the media, so you quoted Timmermans there, um, there is some kind of coherence. Does anyone have a, have a view on that? Because I think it's critical. My personal feeling is that all of the challenges at the moment and the questions of reform and part of the not understanding enough what the EU dimension is, should be, is this relationship with member states. Where should it be adding value? Where should it not? Is it allowed to tell member states to pull their socks up after they've receded and start slipping back? Yes, the lady here. There's a microphone coming. Thank you. Um, it seems to me like um, it's very much about the institutions and um, their sort of stance towards each other. And what I sort of hear is a lot of uh, customers talking. So it's, this is what we want, this is what we want from them, we want this from them and we want that from them. It's not much about the people. And I think Europe should be from the people, it's what the people want, so it's not what the member states want. I don't know what sometimes what the member states are. The member states are also the people. So that's, I'm sort of losing it now. I do um, understand that we need to sort of more talk to uh, one another that, I mean, for me, deep democracy is something, it's more about finding out what everyone wants and not just what the elite wants. And that's another thing. It seems like I have a very highbrow discussion here, which is on the one hand very interesting, but at the same time, I seem to be missing something. I, I feel like I'm somehow in a supermarket, to put it very bluntly. So, what is it that we can buy from Europe? What can Europe buy from the member states? What do we need? I mean, I don't know. Ah, oh, that's, so that's, that's yeah. I'm, I'm making, I'm I, that's interesting. No, no, no. It. No, you're not complicating it. I think it's because that's, that's very interesting. I think, I think there's a lack of, I don't think it's about buying something, but I think that there is, well, that's just my personal opinion. I think there's a lot of vagueness. I think if this continuous difficulty and bashing and what, then we have to sort of say, but when by member states, I mean people. Member states are so, okay, let's yeah. say the citizen, the citizen. So people, I don't like the word citizen, us. Okay, so I'm just saying, I think for me, when we talk about people's endorsement, buy-in to, to, to the EU, feeling like, yeah, it's worth being there, is also about them understanding what value does the EU add and how does it relate to my country that like governs me? It? I was trying to get that relationship out. Yeah. Not, not in the elites, really. What's, what's worth it from an EU dimension to the man on the street? What does the EU add? And so what's that relationship? It's always about what do we want more from the UAE? What are, are we getting already? Oh. It's not enough sometimes about that. Let's just recognise what the value is for the EU as it is. Not what do we want more. Oh, well, forgive That's me, because I, 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 from my perspective, not, but you are right. There is a lot of more, 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 and, and I think I tried to frame at the outset, let's not do just EU bashing. For me, it was really just 
a bit like I said yesterday. No, no, you'll, you'll make a very good point. It's also people understanding what it is. What, how do they understand its added value now? And what do they think it should be? Which I think is a fair ask to people. But OK, let's just, yeah, let me hear. Yeah. As someone who grew up in the UK and now lives in Greece, uh, what, um, what one point of clarification that might help would be, as a democratic union, what does it mean uh, to be a member of that union? It, was it a one-way ticket to be a member of this club? Or th is there um, an option for those who may be default on the directives and fail to change their, their way of, of governance to fit the, the, within the rules? Should they be given uh, an option to step out? But um, again, what would be the consequences of it? Because we're now living through this phase. Um, what, what is the, the impact on this, the, the, the value of membership, um, on the strength mm -hmm. of the, mm -hmm. the European Union, um, and, and what that means for um, basically the, the member states? What is the value of a membership, and was it meant to be a one-way ticket? Mm -hmm. But I think you've articulated possibly more clearly than me exactly what I was trying to say. What is the value? Okay, I've said added value, dimension, that's what I mean. What is, what is it doing for people? Yes, the gentleman up at the top. Thank you for that. Yeah. So, uh, a very bold idea, but we're always coming back to the problem of the member states. Yes? But the elephant in the room here is why not to think about uh, making Europe a republic? Why do we need member states? Why do we need national states? I mean, it's a very bold idea, and I don't say that that will change tomorrow, but it's an utopian idea which never came up here. Mm -hmm. uh, the very first question you asked yesterday was, who feels as a European citizen? And nearly everybody raised his hand. Why do we need member states? Why do we need nation states? I think that's, OK, I'm going it's, to park that for a second. Idea, it so is. I'm not going to put it in this debate. I think it is. I think it's, yeah, I'm not going to put it in this debate, but sure. OK, yes, why do we? Um, yeah, because if the, if the nation states are the problem, who needs them? They are a very young concept. Nation states are not existing for, for a thousand years. But I think eliminating the word nation states, I just posit, is not going to change people's fundamental sense of national identity, culture, remit, language, even yeah, so. Yeah, but, that, but that's a very local concept, no? Um, that can be a very regional uh, identity as well. So. I, I, personally, but I personally think the two aren't mutually exclusive and they can both work, but I think before we'd even get to that stage, we're, we're not even there yet because we're stuck where we are at the moment in this question about what, what do people, how do they see it, what, what's the relationship. Yes, there was another hand. So another hand, can I, I'm just going to check what's coming in on, on, if there is anything on social media. No? Nope. Uh, we have, Kat sorry, was there someone up there? No, it was just, no, you were changing position, okay. Thank you. Can we have Katarzyna? Yes. Okay, uh, so I'm going to bring it down to a very practical aspect of the communication. So uh, I don't want to repeat what I said yesterday in the panel, but I moved myself from the like, more theoretical, let's say, policy strategies approach to come down uh, to the bottom to the activists because I felt this knowledge that we have here just does not, does not exist in the mm -hmm. grassroots in a sufficient way. So for instance, how we do that, we have the uh, social media channels uh, that we build the coalition from, which is like 100 to, to half of the million scope, very different, and they are grassroots social media channels that normally people uh, in Poland follow. So everybody follows their social media channels when they think their ideology is sort of, and I think it's for everybody. And now when the commission gives the statement uh, let's say, on the rule of law. What we do, we just read this, we put it in the very simple memes that are understood, because this is the question, you know? You can say commission should do this, or you should communicate like that. Yes, right, but no one reads the statements, no one goes there, no one watches these videos, except of people who are already, like us, interested. But, uh, I don't know, 30 million people in, uh, in my country do not. So we need to pass this to them in a way that they can relate to this, it comes to their newsfeed, it comes to their Twitter, because otherwise they will never search for this uh, information. So putting this into this like very simple memes and putting this on the, all the channels, not only our organization channels, this is already not enough. So we have to reach to everybody who can pass this very simple message further. But the obstacle is that, again, as I spoke yesterday, 
it circulates in our own environment and ideology again. And the other ideology, because we scan it and like analyze it, this how the interaction, how, how the grassroots and citizens shape the opinion, have their own universe and own galaxy with a conch narrative that says completely the same. So I think we have to come and I, again, like I'm just bringing you like description of how does it look on the daily basis, like from the from the grass, and we need to find a solution uh, on how. Uh, take all of this, what we discuss here, we can have the most beautiful language and more beautiful approach, but if we do not bring it down to people and to the universe that is opposite to us, or maybe at least to the universe that is not in our circle, this is gonna be lost. So I think the key is here and the bridge has to be built here. And of course, all these activities that are on the grassroots are completely not founded. I mean, there is no money in this because the money, and the, it is important because if uh, I don't know, 10 people work voluntary uh, after nights. It's not the same effect and the quality exactly. and the strategy as you, as you would uh, look at, into this in a professional manner. So I, the question is to me, the communication has to leave the levels and the commission and the EU has to work on their own level. And I agree there has the to commission be commission and the EU, the member states work on their level, the yes, multipliers need to work on their each, level. Exactly. Yeah. But what I think we miss the, more, the most, and I think there is completely no awareness of how does this go on the bottom? I never heard in any panel people referring to this level, which is this communication actually being passed to the people. Okay. So Can there has to be work done. There, ha there has to be funds and, uh, and some programs to maybe give capacities to these people. Mm -hmm. Because if they are not there, you stuck then here, you they stuck yeah. here, and people don't get the message, okay. except the one who searched for it. Okay, That's thank you. Thank you for reiterating the point, okay, about how communication gets out there. And if you want people to understand it within what the EU stands for, how we need to get it out there in the different levels. You wanted to come back. I don't know if it's the lady who said, listen, this is just a bit highbrow. I'm not kind of getting to it's about people. Or if you wanted to come in on, yeah. on something else. Uh, well, um, I try to tie it together. Um, actually, uh, I think we perhaps may risk here to create uh, a gap between uh, the elite and uh, the grassroots. That, to me, sounds a bit uh, Trumpish uh, to be crude. I think, actually, we should be very careful uh, by constructing more uh, distance between leaders and grassroots that there actually are. I think, um, basically, uh, to the extent that our countries are democratic and, and there is not sort of messing with elections, I think we must think that the, the politicians we have, the governments we have, are in one way or other the expression of what people at the grassroots think. And, and um, a short side step, we, we have to recognize that like the support for the EU, also the participation in national election varies a lot. And, and some of the countries uh, that we have used as example, here have very low participation in uh, election, uh, parliamentary elections in their own country, not only in relation to the EU. And I think that's really one of the things that I mentioned in my first comments. Uh, actually, that we can't see national democracy and EU democracy as two very separate things. They are closely related. Second, one way street or not, I think, um, I mean, I'm an, actually an old activist. I spent two of my year, years as a student combating EU membership for Norway. And, and I know what it's all about. I have been out in villages of Norway and talking about this. So I know what, we, so I'm, I'm quite familiar with that. And I also later been involved in also grassroots work. I, I know what, quite well that it works. But still, um, we can't um, sort of say to ourselves that um, EU is something that we can go in and out as we would like. Um, um, Brexit is the first time this happens, really. Greenland left some years ago, but nobody really noticed uh, that the, they left the EU, and, and it probably had very little consequences. But the Brexit will, however uh, it happens, it will have dramatic consequences. And then, actually, I, I would suggest that instead of saying that people can sort of uh, threaten to withdraw from the EU if uh, they feel that some policies of the kind we have discussed 
are becoming too interfering or, or that the EU decide too much of the business uh, going on in their country. I mean, we, we can't accept that kind of system where people can blackmail uh, the colleagues in the council. We must have a system where, we, within reasonable degrees, we accept the rules of the game. And, and if you are a member, you have to follow those rules. And if you are Norway and some other countries, uh, like Switzerland, you are not a member. And you have to accept what the council uh, decides and then the parliament decides. But you are part of the market. And that's an other way of being sort of related to the EU and enjoy some of the advantages but also pay the price of some disadvantages. Thank you. I think I will come to you because you wanted to say, but I think this idea of accepting the rules of the game, I think you also, and it's right at the end, so we, we, I will close things soon, but I think you also um, put your finger on something which is very much about human nature. It's the difficulty. It's having something and then the difficulty of coming to the table with accepting the rules of the game. There is also the issue that this gentleman has raised, that Balash has raised about, okay, well, there is this cooperative mechanism. People can feed into it. There is this consultation that is within the rules of the game. And yet still, there are voices that are not coming through in terms of the legislation that comes out. But I think you wanted to reply on what he said at initial about not seeing national and EU democracy as you were shaking your head there on the same I was, I was, level. Because again, it's, uh, in theory, it's of course it's true that uh, you know, governments are <coughs> the projection of, uh, of, of people's will, right? So that's what you were saying that, you know, voters will at the end of the day, are voters views are at the end of the day represented by governments but uh, you know no wonder uh, when uh, mid-september the president of the commission announced his package to reform the democratic processes within the EU he was talking a lot about uh, the European citizens initiative reform but also about financing of European political parties reform and the their desire to get more people involved in the political processes is, is, is easily understandable if you see the turnout data of European parliamentary elections. Mm -hmm. And obviously in some countries where voting is mandatory at elections, you know, uh, the situation is different from countries where, you know, with 50, 55% of voter participation, you can actually have constitutional majority two-thirds of the votes and in some of these countries voter turnout is as low at the EP elections is as low as uh, six you know 16 17 20 percent so uh, you know that that to me that's a democratic uh, deficit but I don't want to blame I don't want to pretend that I blame uh, EU institutions for everything you know I, I I think it's it's not necessarily the fault of the EU that in many many member states European the European Parliament and the status of being a European parliamentarian uh, representative is much lower than, than the national parliament. And you know, the wide part of the large part of the public perceives the European Parliament as a secondary, you know, not that important institution. Uh, but I believe the direction what the Commission uh, set up uh, and in, in mid-September is actually a good one. Uh, because the future of, uh, uh, of the democratic legitimacy and credibility of the Union very much depends on uh, how many people we can convince and involve in the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. uh, increase transparency, increase accountability, and provide even more ways for people to participate are good tools uh, mm -hmm. uh, to, 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 to progress on that path. Okay. I'm going to park it there. Yes, no, because I was going to come to you. Did you have something come in on social media? Yeah. We have one question that's asking all of the panelists. What do you think about initiatives such as Poles of Europe? I'm not sure if that's spelled correctly, but specific initiatives that are Poles. P-U-L-S of Europe. I'm not sure if this is spelled correctly. But what do you think about these types of initiatives that exist? Yes, the lady here. Just yes. you want to come? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, my name is Bettina Ulrich and I'm working in the University College. Yeah, keep it right here. Uh, so 
Pulse of Europe is an initiative. It started in Germany, and they are, people are coming together every Sunday and showing their support for the European Union because people have been afraid of, because of Brexit and other, other initiatives, that um, there will be too many countries want to going out, of, want to go out of the Union. So, uh, and I just. I can see that this movement is really spreading to other countries, and like you even have um, people meeting in Stockholm or also in Barcelona and also in Rome or in Poland. So I was wondering, what do you think? Um, maybe the question to the person who is working in Berlin: What do you think about such initiatives? I, I personally believe uh, that these are very important things, and I'm, I'm, what I was really um, happy to see was the large number of young people taking part in, in this movement. It's not the usual, uh, you know, 35 plus uh, type of, uh, you know, already convinced pro-Europeans, but it's very young people who are expressing their anger and, 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 and frustration. And I think it's a great thing. Uh, the question is how these movements can, uh, uh, you know, r be run in a sustainable way. How can the energy, uh, you know, uh, kept? Uh, and I think different EU institutions has uh, responsibility uh, to work together with these groups, not necessarily in the way of funding, but to show them paths and pot pot possible tools to get involved. And I and, and I see a huge potential in this. But I think it's also you echo what Katarzyna said because it is also about um, having the resources to go out and have conversations. So if we are having conversations, which we have said, you know, what do people think? What do they want? How do you get out there? Then you also have to have capacity building to know how to speak the language, which is what I said at the outset of those people, in order to bring great engagement. Because I agree that I think it's an enormous challenge to get turnout for EP elections. My view is if you just lock down into the daily life of all of us with all our busyness, this busy sickness, and what we do and picking the kids up and going to work and my boss stressing me and no time for a fag break and this and that and that and that and that and then I've got rant, rant, rant and I've got everything going on at national level in the political sphere and on top of that I have to take account of what's happening in the EU sphere which I am within but is further away as we've said it is a big ask to get people you know in that sense I think we are more echo chambery here to grab people to say right what does it mean why do you want to have a voice yeah I mean considering uh, how large part of our activity is happening online and how increasingly, how much time we are spending uh, with our uh, devices, with digital devices, and, and considering the experience of countries which did introduce uh, uh, online voting, you know, I, I don't think uh, the hard part is to convince people that they need to spend that five minutes or 60 minutes uh, to, uh, to go to the polling station or uh, if we are introducing online voting, uh, vote online. That's not the not hard part. Not to convince them. The, to no, get them that's to, not the hard to, part. To get them to no. understand why no, and how. The, the hard part is to make them believe that what they are, that they have an influence and when they vote on something, there is going, there are going to be consequences. That's, that's the hard part. And the reason why uh, we see uh, below 20, you know, below 20 percent turnout in certain countries is because in those countries, however noble the EU uh, use I, I, as an idea, and however big support the people have for the EU, they just simply don't see the European Parliament as a strong player, and we need to change that. I think. Okay. Thank yeah, you. Just a last very, word for you, and a last word for you. Very quick yes. ID, because in fact, people uh, don't need just to be involved uh, in more political ways, there are other ways of people getting involved and I think a uh, very, very interesting example that is going on and is related to people has to do with the Erasmus and Erasmus Plus program, which basically involves the interchange of students, faculty, staff all over Europe and allows clearly, and I have, uh, I'm teaching this year a huge group with many Erasmus students from all over Europe and also from outside the EU countries. And discussions we get there, the stereotype deconstruction, if you want, that happens along the discussions is so, so interesting. And I think this might be clearly a locus where through open debate, open discussions, exchange of ideas, we can help enhance and create this awareness for the need for engagement 
and for this need to be more responsive, more engaged in the end. I think it's a, 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 an incredible program that is out there and that can, in fact, have a, a big influence in these, in these processes. Okay, can we just come to this gentleman? Thank you. Yes, thank, thank you. Thank you for concluding, Ben. Very, very quick comments. Um, people have referred to the European Parliament elections. Um, it's right that the voting is lower than in national elections, but um, um, it's possibly wrong that was said yesterday that the participation is decreasing. Actually, it, it's, it's fairly stable, actually, and, and there are only five to six countries where there is any trend towards l less participation. So, I mean, please, we shouldn't repeat that um, a sort of journalistic point that it's decreasing, that's really fault. Um, I think we really look forward, uh, look, have to look for ways to engage uh, citizens in Europe in more deliberation, thinking, knowledge about what's happening in Europe. And actually, um, you have referred to the European Citizen Initiative. Um, of course, that is one way, but it's perhaps even too limited and, and it's not, has not had very much impact so far. We also have, I don't think people have mentioned that, um, there is also now rounds of citizens' dialogue with commissioners. The commissioners uh, are traveling around. Maria Thyssen was here uh, in, uh, Marianne Thyssen was here in Lisbon some weeks ago. And I think actually, let people have the opportunity to come and talk with and hear what the commissioners have to say. That is important. And I think we also um, should help people to learn more about also the commission online consultations, where actually any one of us can present views to the EU online. And, and that's, uh, I think, for some people, that's one way of also getting, feeling, feeling that the EU is that not remote. And uh, yesterday, um, I think it was Bernard Reber who mentioned that um, uh, Macron, the French president, um, and, and also with the support of Juncker in the commission, has suggested that one could organize in all member states uh, what is sometimes called democratic conventions or mini-publics, where one invites a sort of uh, group of 50, 60 people who represent the variety of people in that country to discuss EU policies in, in, in a way, and, and some of us have actually considerable experience with organ, organizing that kind of forums where you, you invite people, uh, of course uh, 50, 60 people cannot be strictly speaking statistically representative of the whole population, but it's surprising how much different views you can get discussed within even that number of people. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, that's an issue that really should be supported. And, and I think actually, to end on a positive note, I think that's a way of promoting what we talked about yesterday, European active citizenship. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to, to uh, round things off now. I think for me, I mean, it's again, incredibly wide ranging. So we went to a lot of areas for me. I still do feel that when we talk about, when we go back to the, to the nub of what we are discussing, the EU democracy, reshaping democracy, there are challenges, challenges to democracy. So how is the EU addressing those? How is it dealing with those? How is it managing how it appears on the world stage in the light of those and what is happening internally? I still think something very critical and important, and, and I really do reassure you to the lady who said it's very highbrow, I mean in the way that it affects people, is what is that relationship between the EU and the member states? How do people understand it? And where, where do they see the two coming together? I think you made a valuable point about if you're going to have a place at the table or join the party, you need to accept a certain amount of rules. So it's also so how we go about those discussions. Um, and I do pick up on what you said, that there is, a, there is a challenge because there is this retreat at member state level. And I still sort of leave with that discussion, with that thought out there. You know, what, what are people 
how do they perceive the EU in those discussions, in how they speak out? I think that is, that is, that is critical. And I, for me, I still feel there is this very vague understanding of what that dynamic and that relationship between member states and the EU is and where possibly some of the confusion and the EU bashing is coming from. So I thank you all very, very much. Uh, it was a big one. Go and air your brains. We're only five minutes behind, but we started five minutes late. So well done, everybody. Thank you. And let's come back here. I think we've got, what, 20 minutes, something like that, realistically. And we need to do Slido. Yes, I know. So you've got 20 minutes. Let's just have a look at the outcomes of Slido, please. 15. Well, good luck with that. I think we'll say 20 because I don't think I'll be back here in 15. So what did we say? So how can open government be achieved? Greater public debate, greater public involvement through consultation and debate. Okay. So essentially an active civil society, as you endorsed. Okay. So on that note, uh, let's see you back here in your seats kindly at 25 past 11 for the last session of the day. Thank you all. Oh, God, a warm round of applause for our speakers. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. It's just, it's very fascinating. I think it's probably also fascinating for people. So, for me, and I, I didn't wish to come back and talk to perceptions. I didn't.
yes, yes, but you are the best kid in school. Okay, okay, we settle, we come in. I just let the gentleman settle. Thank you. Um, so, we are on the home stretch uh, with our last panel, Research and Innovation, Building a Stronger Democratic Europe. What are we going to look at? Um, I'd already mentioned this in the outset, that, that, that the knowledge and the reflection that research and innovation generates is really crucial to informing and shaping decision-making processes that are going to influence the future of democracy in Europe, or democracies. So what kind of knowledge is needed in the future to shape democracy? What's coming up? Um, and also, how do you think that we can build stronger bridges stronger links, stronger relationships between research and policy making. And critically, and, and, and just so that everyone knows that as a moderator I listen, um, how do we bring society into this? So what is it for people on the ground? How do we get them involved, okay? So let's try and keep it very concrete. Yeah, not too highbrow, very concrete. And let's see what comes out of it. We just let these last couple of people come in. Can we, do, um, can we do a Slido? Do we have Slido ready, please? Now, the Slido is, if you're, if you're there with your phones, in which areas should research be intensified, or could research be intensified, uh, to achieve better outcomes for democracy? Is it an educate? These are, obviously, it's, you, you are very limited here, okay? So we are really bringing it down, and I'm sure for all of you, that's just, you're going to be, oh my god, geez, okay, just those three, but if you had to, uh, what would you go for? Education, law, ICT. So here on the home stretch, so please put all your energies in for these people. We have Fiorella Battaglia. Battaglia, I would say. Yes, thank you. That was a very bad pronunciation. Fiorella Battaglia, Professor Philosophy and Political Theory at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich. We have Ramon Flescher, sociologist and head researcher, Impact EV. Do, do you all know Impact EV? You're all well aware of it? Am I right? The aim of Impact EV under the EU seventh framework program was to develop a permanent system of selection, monitoring, and evaluation of the various impacts of social sciences and humanities research. Is that correct? Okay, so now you do know. And Milena Zichfuchs, who is a member of the high level group on maximizing impact of EU RI programs. So, ladies and gents, if you have or haven't been here, I'm trying to keep things nice and concise because I'm hoping, I think we will have lots of questions from the floor on this one, but I will, of course, be asking you to kick us off. First of all, thanks for having me here because I think this is a very challenging topic, democracy. And um, yes, uh, I will uh, um, I will try to illustrate my role in the production of knowledge. And uh, yes, I am a philosopher. Uh, and uh, yes, I know nobody is perfect, but as Ramon said. <laughs> Uh, interdisciplinarity is a good thing, and uh, this is which uh, uh, we strive to get to work together with social scientists. And the goal is to get uh, at the end some knowledge uh, which is normative, but it, which is not so um, separated from the empirical, for, for, from the real world. So at the end. Uh, we, we try to have some empirical research which is guided by uh, normative theory which is in turn revised by empirical research. This is the first thing I would like uh, to tell you. And uh, the second thing, and, 
I think uh, that knowledge uh, um, plays a um, relevant role in democracy because uh, in the, we want uh, to act in democracy. And uh, I think uh, we don't just need to pass the message to the people because we have uh, first to understand the people and we have to understand how people feel, how people think, and how people act. And then, drawing on this awareness, drawing on this knowledge, then we can deliver some insights to the policymaker in order to have some policies which are uh, cultural sensitive. And this is, uh, for example, the main task of um, the project I am currently uh, working, which is Recrire, the representation of the crisis uh, and the crisis of the representation. And the other thing I would like to uh, tell you is that um, the, the point, uh, the main aim of the project is not uh, on economic issues. And not, we, we don't think that economic issues are not important in the crisis in Europe, but we think that there is uh, more. And this is more is the culture of the people in Europe. And uh, so we are trying, we are focusing on this other dimension, because there are um, some phenomena which cannot be explained only by drawing on economic issues. And I think that's enough for now. Am I on now? Yes. Thank you. Um, so it's very interesting coming from a communications perspective, what we call strategic insights. That is what your job is. You are saying we have to understand how people feel, how people act to offer culturally sensitive policies to the policy maker. Not just them saying, you do this, but what are they thinking? What are they feeling? What are they wanting? And delivering that information to shape the policy making. Out of interest in your experience, or is this a first that you're doing that specific uh, approach. Do you find policymakers, do you have any knowledge that policymakers take this up, that they use it, that they think it's valuable? So this is the question um, on the impact of our research in the uh, university. And uh, yes, I think uh, this is, uh, um, this is something that you have in a European project because you can work together with other colleagues of other disciplines and together with policymakers. And so then you can try to have an impact. But I think that Ramon would be able to say more about the that. impact. Okay. Yes. All right. Ramon, over to you. Just uh, do, use this one because that one's a bit dodgy. Can you? No, no. Use if you can. Use that. Do really hold it there because it does make a difference for them to hear, please. And, and just under so they can see your face too. Yeah, it's an odd thing, but yes, thank you. <laughs> yes, but you're doing it right. Okay, it's okay like this at the end. Yes, thank you. So uh, first, orientation of first learn not lesson learn from our analysis of almost all uh, projects of the FP7 on social science and humanities and many of the Horizon 2020, also FP6 and FP5. First lesson learned. A stronger focus on democracy in the whole process of research, a stronger social impact in democratizing European societies. One of the examples, the FP5 work law focused on creation of new occupational opportunities for Roma people and another disadvantaged peoples. The conclusions of this project was explained in the European Parliament by one illiterate Roma who was at this moment also grandmother. And as a result of this, the European Parliament approved by unanimity the conclusion 
that was the recognition of the Roma people and the compromise to consult to them, to the Roma, the elaboration and the approval of any politics concerning them. This was also approved by unanimity by parliaments of the member states, not all, but many, and also parliaments of the regions. And Roma strategies had developed, been developed in the whole Europe, creating occupational opportunities, educational opportunities, and so on. This democratic conclusion was the result of a research where the Roma people and the policymakers participated since the first moment of the research until the last moment. I don't know if you like another example now or it's better later. Hmm? Uh, you can give another example, yes? Just to yes, yeah. uh, I introduced uh, it just uh, half an hour ago, listening the um, debate. Hmm? In uh, one Horizon 2020, that is not yet finished, it is in process, which name is Solidus, one of the successful cases they an uh, are, have analyzed is the case of one young woman that uh, in Catalonia, in Barcelona, that lost her eye for a rubber, uh, a pilot rubber, by the Catalan Police. This young woman that has not university studies, that is from the working class, was able to create a movement in Catalonia, led by her, that got at the end the prohibition of this uh, rubber no, by the Catalan police. At the beginning, the parliament was against, but through a dialogic process on social movements and the different parliamentarian groups, she got that. This is a focus on solutions. Mm? That means that he, she has created a kind of dynamics we can extend now, for instance, to my country, in Basque country, or to Spain, in order to get this provision for any policies. This is a focus on solutions, not on complainings. Complainings are important, but they are not the solutions for people. And how she got there? This, because she participated before in two researchers, not as a professional researcher, as a participant, in two European FP researchers, as a participant. And she explained that was she learned, participating democratically with uh, very famous professors. No? But in an egalitarian dialogue, he, she could develop in creating this movement. Okay, so you're, you said there is a focus on solutions here. We are looking yes. at, okay, okay, so hold that thought, please. I will come now uh, to Milena and come back. I don't know if the thrust of your introduction is what is the role of SSNH in contributing solutions to European problems and our role in the creation of knowledge or something other? Well, I'll see. something other. Okay. Uh, okay, but first I would like to introduce myself. I have nothing to do with democracy. I have never done research. I'm a linguist. And uh, during the last, what is it, 10 to 15 years, I have become quite multidisciplinary. I do linguistics and uh, neuroscience. So I come from a completely different world. And the reason I've been invited here is this. This is the famous Lamy report. And I know that some people in the audience are, will know it by heart by now. Uh, but I also know that a lot of you don't. Uh, and that is not a sin, but if you want to go forward with this idea, and I, I will be talking about future and future knowledges, mm -hmm. a different mindset towards research. Mm -hmm. uh, but I would like to say, because of the people who are not uh, uh, familiar with the report, or not familiar enough, if you like, uh, why, why, you know, why this report? Number one since we talked about the commission in the earlier uh, uh, session, uh, I think it was for the first time in a sense that the commission got 12 people 
Uh, that's, you know, us in total, as we call ourselves, the Lamy Group, uh, to set out a vision for the future framework program, still called FP9, but you moderated the, the whole day event in Brussels, so you're well versed in it. Uh, and to come up with fundamental ideas to push certain things forward. And I will go through these things forward, and then I will refer to the topic of democracy and what I've learned here, what I've heard here, and see, uh, I, I will be very honest with you, how I see the things that I've heard and learned uh, for a possible mission, as the mm -hmm. uh, report mm -hmm. suggests that the future uh, 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 let's say basic, if I may call them that, collaborative efforts will be called. Number one, this is, and has a, this again goes back to the previous session, its main mission is to increase the budget for research and innovation from 80 billion, what is the horizon, uh, may, uh, well, it's a bit less, so it's going to be a bit less, unfortunately, but that was the aim. It's to push it up to 120 billion, which means going through the Council mentioned previously and the EU Parliament. So when you read this, if you haven't read it so far, keep this in mind. This is one of the, uh, I think, basic things. The other basic thing is the notion of innovation. Uh, which I think has been well, I'm not saying it's perfect, but well redefined in the document itself. Because innovation primarily, and this, it's, this does not come from me, this comes from the people from the Innovation Council, when asked directly, how, how do we achieve more innovation, they said, and Pascal Ami asked, he said one word, and they said multidisciplinarity, which by itself, is a very complex phenomena of knowledges, not just knowledge, but knowledges that you have to get together. Uh, and why innovation? Uh, it's, and this is no joke, I've seen the figures. Uh, Europe has an outstanding, if not the best research output in the world. The number of papers, the quality of the papers, the journals where they come out of, etc., etc., etc. However, we're not good at innovation in comparison to China, the United States, Korea, etc. Uh, they are far ahead, although they don't have you know, the excellent research we have. The question that we try to address here is how to bridge this gap. And uh, basically, when you read this, it brings up the question, what is relevant knowledge, if I may go back to you? You know, what kind of knowledges, new cultures of knowledges, if you're talking about multidisciplinarity, do we need? But it also implies something which I find fascinating because it relates to the democracy uh, discussion, is changing mindset, something that has been a preoccupation of mine for a very long time. If FP9, and it will be based on this, so there are no illusions about that, uh, uh, I think a lot of changing of mindsets within approaching research topics in the broader sense of the word possible will be necessary. And the last thing I'll say in general, and then if I may address the democracy very quickly, and I have six points, I'll do them because you know all the stuff by now, is the timeline. Uh, first and foremost, 2018 is going to be a very dynamic year. Uh, we're going to have a, a new parliament elected, a new commissioner. Uh, everything's going to be new. Uh, you, uh, President Juncker, is, he said he's not going for a second mandate. So the commission will be changed. A lot of things will be changing. Uh, which, uh, you know, you never knew. This is a big question my, uh, to my line. And the timeline for getting FP9 on the table is very, very short. The Commission has promised that by June we will have the first draft of FP9, as everybody's calling it. Actually, I hope they stick to it, but okay. They probably won't. Uh, uh, will be on the table. And if I may invite everybody, and I've been doing this very systematically wherever I've been invited, in uh, July, uh, in Toulouse, there is, we're going to have what is called ESOF. It's the big European Science Festival. 
and it's a great place to be. I've been to all of them except one in Copenhagen a couple of years back. I'm on the steering committee of ESOP, so I can do this officially. Uh, there are too few people, and I've been to ESOPs where there have, there's been nobody from the humanities and very, very little attendance from the social sciences. And it's a place, if we're, call, we're talking about multidisciplinarity, excellent for networking and finding out what's going on in the other fields of research. Now, how do we apply all of this, uh, you know, highbrow stuff to what I've heard, you know, what I've heard during the last days? Now, one thing I would like to say at the beginning is that democracy has been on the table, so it's not mentioned in the report, but um, it's been on the table, so to speak, as a possible mission. I would also like to add that a person who's been mentioned quite a few times here and is unfortunately not with us uh, anymore, Philippe, thought that democracy would be an excellent topic for a mission within the new fro uh, framework. And I would agree with him. And I will, this is not in line of priority. It's how these things came up through the various mm -hmm. sessions. Okay. Uh, things that have been touched upon, education, uh, citizen science, that's in the report. In other words, how do you get the citizens involved? This has already been done in the Netherlands up to, I, I, I received three books from uh, Alice not long ago, a couple of days ago actually, and I haven't read them, but I know quite a bit about what they did. So education, citizen science, this is all in here. So you can relate to these things very, very directly. Education in the sense of critical thinking, and if you're talking about democracy, when do you start? Katrina mentioned uh, uh, kindergarten yesterday. Uh, well, I, you know, I'm no expert in education. I don't know whether kindergarten is the right place to start, but, uh, uh, this, but this is it. We had language on the table, communication, very important. And if I may compliment the three ladies from last night, face-to-face -face interaction, and this is me speaking as a linguist, is a must. Mm -hmm. It's a must. Uh, you know, I won't go into linguistic details, but you cannot uh, go without it. So you've got, you know, all kinds of linguists and other people dealing with language and communication. Uh, citizenship and civil society, again, citizen science, which is in here. This is a way of, you know, getting it through. Uh, in the last session, thank God that uh, the global dimension and not just EU was mentioned, that, you know, if you're looking for these relevant knowledges and what, let's say, the question, how does democracy wor or work uh, in different countries and outside of Europe? Very, very important for understanding what's going on in Europe itself. Mm -hmm. uh, something that uh, didn't, came up as a subtext, uh, I would call it, uh, what, uh, and that again is in the report, is that risk-taking with the missions is totally acceptable. If you get a negative answer, fine. This is, you know, but it's explicitly stated. Because so far, uh, all the, you know, when you look at Horizon, Ramon, etc., they have to have positive outcomes. I have been claiming for a very long time a negative answer is just, can be, doesn't have to be, but can be just as groundbreaking as a positive answer. Yeah. Uh, are they, but uh, just to be clear, so these are, you said it was six points, so these are the ones, the education, the language, the citizen, these well, are the key, I think you mentioned that there were six key links or yes, six well, the, points, I'm yeah, these are, these are the ones, yeah, yeah, yeah. go on. And, uh, yeah. I'm coming to the last one, equality, which of course is a part of democracy as we heard, but I will not mm -hmm. elaborate other people who really know, but my last point is, how do you articulate all these very interesting points that have been brought up into research questions? Mm -hmm. How do you get these research questions to make a whole for a mission that would be potentially uh, uh, called democracy, mm -hmm. let's say, I'm making this up, right? This mm -hmm. is, I think, the way that, since you've got time, but relative time, and also my last message to net for society, uh, uh, and they've been extremely active in, in the concept for this conference. It said, now is the time to speak up for SSH. This has already been done. It's in here. Mm -hmm. SSH is in bold. The only two areas of research that are there. 
uh, mention, and I'm getting a lot of complaints from the biomedical sciences and the natural sciences, you know, why didn't you mention us kind of thing. Uh, uh, there's a history to it that many people know, so I won't go into it. But the thing to do now is to act. This report has been on the table since July the 3rd. Uh, uh, the thing is to come up with concrete proposals towards the Commission, but articulated as research questions. Okay. And this is the name of the game. And do it, if I may say, as soon as possible. Mm -hmm. Because the LAMI group is still in, in existence. We have already, and some of you know about them, people have been suggesting concrete missions for SSH, and for various multidisciplinary endeavors that could end up as being financed by uh, FP9. Okay. Thank okay. you. Okay, so basically people need to get their skates on, but the crux is how do you articulate these points, all the points you went through, the citizen science, the education, the language, the equality, the, the, the point of critical thinking, uh, how do you articulate them into research missions? I also had a conversation no, with the... Questions, uh, sorry, questions, questions, I beg your pardon, into questions yeah. in order to shape them into a mission. So, uh, there was, a, I don't know whether I should point to the lady who I had a chat with who said I had some questions, but I haven't asked. Who did I, was I speaking to outside? Because you had just made the point there at the end about, you know, sometimes the outcomes, it doesn't have to be knowing or definitive. We, we need to... We need to consider what the outcomes are. I know this is a challenge with the Commission about impacts and how do you measure impacts, but there was, just say there was a lady I was talking to outside. Did you want to kick off with a question or are you hiding? Well, yes, it was you. Hang on, I'm just going to put my finger right there. Yes, there is a, there's a microphone. It's... And obviously, say who you are, unless you're known by yeah. everybody. That would I'm help. I'm Annette Knutson. I'm from Copenhagen Business School in Denmark. Um, thank you for your already very interesting input. And uh, I had, we just briefly discussed in the break, and you have actually already addressed it somehow, that asking the question is actually providing also, always already half the answer. And, uh, and so, because the, so, so far the experience with integrating SSH, especially in the challenges that are not Challenge 6, in the current uh, framework program. Um, the SSH involvement is very prescriptive in the, in the way the calls are, are formulated. At, at least I often hear, I work with researchers helping them articulate their, of writing their applications. And they often say, oh, I would love to work with this team, but I would have liked to approach it from a different angle. So um, I was kind of thinking, um, to make this interesting for the, for the SSH, especially in the other, I mean, now we're obviously looking to FP9, and it's maybe not so interesting to talk about Horizon, but this possibility of, of shuffling around the way you're asking the question, maybe also as we go along, not only at the outset of the next framework program, but as we go along, if that could be built into the way uh, the calls are designed, I think that would be very interesting to a lot of SSH researchers. So that greater flexibility, that d ability to ask the questions. Yeah, the, that's the a, yeah. room for maneuvering greater and maybe rephrasing the way yeah. that the challenge has been uh, answer, articulated. No. Uh, I'd love to answer yeah. that one. Uh, uh, flexibility is the key word to understanding missions. Uh, and this is what the LAMI group has been insisting on. You know, this, that you, you know, this risk that has been, I hope they'll have built it into the program itself, uh, the idea that if you come up with a negative answer that this is great because it can be great, but what you are addressing, this is my pet subject, so, you know, during lunch I'd love to have a word with you. Uh, it is exactly this. Uh, unfortunately, with Horizon, and everybody knows here the history, I won't go into that, SSH came in too late. There's a group of people in this room that put up exceptional efforts into getting SSH on the table at all, because the famous green paper that came out before Christmas of 2010 did not have one single mention of SSH anywhere. I stress that. And then we put up a fight, but it was too late. And you're quite right, that there's been a sort of disbalance throughout the horizon challenges, uh, uh, very much so. 
But the thing that you mentioned is I would love to see, and I have a couple of ideas, but I'm not allowed to uh, uh, give out secrets, uh, is to have an SSH-led mission that would incorporate the other domains of science. So that is my vision of, my personal vision of the future. Okay. Another, can I open it, can I keep it open to the floor? Does anybody else have a, Bernard? Yes, thank you. You do like to move around, don't you, sir? You started <clears throat> there, then you went there, now you're there. Okay, you're keeping, thank you. Thank you, Bernard Robert. You already know me. So uh, I have two questions. The first question is uh, for the last speaker, Milena. Um, <clears throat> I'm a bit astonished that um, uh, you've mentioned, perhaps as a future kind of research, the relationship between um, the citizens and science. And OK, uh, there is a big cross-cutting issues in, among the H2020 program. is a, a responsible innovation and research. And it's, it's exactly that. So, do, do we, uh, I, I, my question is a bit, we, we, we do things inside this, pro, this program, this project, and we don't know and, and, uh, what the other are doing, and, and, and it's, a, it's a bit sad. Um, but perhaps you have ideas regarding that. So, uh, sorry, and perhaps, what's, what's the specific question? But the specific question is, uh, since <laughs> 2013, uh, most than 20 big European projects have, wor have been working on responsible innovation yeah. and research. Uh -huh. And before that, you had the big program uh, since three different uh, 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 European uh, programs of research uh -huh. on science and society, science with society. Uh -huh. okay. so, so all this research is lost or not, or can we uh, build on, on the results? It's uh -huh. a bit that. What, uh, can it be cumulative? Innovation okay. is not... Uh, to start again the same things, I think, uh, to, okay. put, to put it like that, because uh, uh, okay. it's, it's yep. the end of the day. And uh, another, another question is, is for uh, Fiorella. Uh, <clears throat> as uh, you work on, on representation and uh, representative democracy, and you've mentioned a project, uh, what kind, and to make a connection with the first uh, um, discussion we had uh, for the first panel yesterday, uh, what kind of representation can we have on an executive level for Europe, uh, it will not be uh, possible through a person. And do you think it's, it's a problem of, re of representation <clears throat> or much more a problem of responsibility, the way responsible people, people who have responsibilities, responsable politique in French, we say, uh, behave and, and the, the kind of control we can have. Uh, so we can play uh, responsibility against representation, in okay. a sense. Thank it's you. clear, the second question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah. okay. It's clear. Yeah. We'll, we'll start. Yes, thank you. No, it starts. Come back first. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, um, the project name, the project's name is uh, the Recreere, so representation of crisis and crisis of re representation. And yes, I know it's very difficult, but you know, the, most of the colleagues in the project are cultural psychologists. So then uh, we need an, explain, an explanation for the, for the name um, at, at the very beginning. And the, the point of the project is to investigate the cultural milieu of European societies. And the project is uh, focusing on the crisis but uh, not on the economic issues of the crisis. Uh, the point is that uh, we need to understand the, how people make sense of their experience in Europe, because this is uh, the problem now. And as we understand this uh, 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 interpretation of the European societies, then uh, we can draw on this uh, interpretation of the world and we can help policy makers in order to deliver cultural sensitive policies. This is, this is Did that exactly answer your, I think you just missed the thrust of your question there possibly? Because or is it- You mentioned the res, uh, responsibility. responsibility. Yeah. So and that's the, it, okay. Okay, but in this framework, uh, I don't see the point of responsibility. As, yeah, make it really nice and be very 
concise what, what you're not getting at, what your explicit question is. Yeah. No, the, the point is uh, to understand um, be, the behavior of the people. And we think that uh, usually you have uh, a model in order to interpret the uh, behavior of the people. And this model is the homo economicus. But you know, the, this model uh, has been criticized in, in the last years. And what we have instead is another model, which is uh, uh, not, uh, um, not so much reliable as the first one. And this is the homo behavioral. And uh, according to this model, people um, act following two systems. And the, uh, the first system is the, the system of the homo economicus, and the second system is the behavioral uh, system. And according to this system, you, how you make decision? You make decision very fast, and you, you have some biases, and you have some shortcomings. And so the idea behind this model is that people act irrationally. And our hypothesis is not people don't act irrationally, but people try to make sense of their experience. So the. Um, we have to understand this rationality, which is broader than the rationality implied in the, in the two models. Because the requirement of this model of rationality are stability, people ten, tend to make their representation of the world stable and coherent. And this is the point of the project. Okay, if it hasn't, can we continue that discussion? Yeah. If, if I might just go elsewhere at the moment, but outside. Yeah. Can you keep, because I want to, no, let me go. Come back first. There was a question there about where is all of this? So you've got, where is it all gone, all of this knowledge? Can it be ag aggregated? Can it be cumulative? What's, where are these outputs going? Uh, I mean, it's a big yes to what you're saying. One thing that we had to do, believe me, uh, terrible, uh, is uh, we had to do a very thorough midterm horizon evaluation, and this, is, this report is based on the findings so far, but also on FP7, 6, etc., the more recent ones. But there's a difference, a very crucial difference between what we wrote up here. What you are talking about is uh, actual research projects, questions that were around in all the framework programs, etc. But this, uh, what you find here, and this is why I mentioned the Dutch example, since we're talking about democracy, is getting from the citizens their views on what, which research to them would be most relevant. So it's not just, you know, research projects. It's a dialogue with the citizens of Europe. How are they going to do it? I don't know. You know, there's a lot of I don't knows. And the Dutch example, uh, uh, well, it's been publicized quite extensively, and I think it should, is uh, uh, and there's a wonderful one from New Zealand where they ask the researchers, I'll do the New Zealand one because the uh, Dutch stuff is, Alice, is it online? Uh, the, yeah, so you can find it there. Uh, but in New Zealand, for instance, they asked the citizens what are the priorities for research. And the researchers came up with a bunch of, you know, questions, etc. And the first priority that the citizens came up with had nothing to do with the questions that the researchers put forward. They said, we want ho houses that are resilient to earthquakes. You know, a completely mm -hmm. different view. What, what is hoped to be you know, and what the end result should be if we get into this, and I hope we will, uh, is this kind of relationship, a democratic voice for the citizens of Europe uh, uh, to come forward with their ideas and views what relevant research would be. I know one that this is, a, it was rather informal, but it's still uh, uh, worth mentioning. And it's a word that was very much present in the sessions, inequality. It is an issue that uh, uh, European citizens worry about a great deal. 
So whoever is going to, if, if, if you're going to come up with a mission on democracy, this is something that I, even from the discussions here and the talks people gave, uh, would have a high priority uh, uh, in my view. I'm no expert, of course. Okay. Can I, in, in all fairness, cause, can I come back to you, Alice? Because you, you were... You were the lady frustrated before. So, no, 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 it's good. I, I want to pick up on things. It's important also the moderator listens. So I'm asking you specifically in this, quest, in this now, because you said, come on, I'm not hearing what about the citizen? What does the citizen want? I just want to just open this. You looked at solutions. You gave some examples of, cit of specifically citizens, people going there, interacting with the political process, coming with outcomes. You're looking at how citizens are, what they need, informing the process. Within this, how do you think um, the citizen should be brought into this process of mixing research with you know, societal outcomes? I mean, we just raised the, the importance of equality. You raised that you ask people what they want. It's very different to what the researchers, no, not you, sorry, the example that you gave, different to what the researchers did. Do you have any thoughts on bringing bringing society into that in creating those solutions and informing policy making. The, the lady here with the microphone. Well, I could say a little bit more about the Dutch process, but I don't want to say too much about it. Actually, there's a, a whole booklet about how we set up the whole process of getting citizens involved in what kind of questions they would be interested in. And in a way, it's a bit similar to something that but maybe with a smaller uh, a target group, I think it was Scient uh, Scient uh, Scientific American did about 10 years ago. They also came up with the 150 most important questions that research should answer. So what we started right. out with is actually a big sort of process uh, through uh, social media, papers, uh, over the internet, whatever, to, and we just encourage people to send in questions whatever questions they might be, and we got something about 14,000 of them. And some of them were really ridiculous, to be honest. I mean, and quite a few actually were sort of very uh, um, complicated and uh, was like something like, I mean, how can we get rid of poverty in the world? How can we get total world peace? I mean, things like that. So what we had to do afterwards, and so that's why I'm saying it's not really simple to get citizens in, in such a process, is to actually take all these questions and go through them one by one, trying to um, sort of group them in certain sections of bigger questions that mm -hmm. could actually be addressed Addressing by those. research. Right. So that's a very important mm -hmm. part of that process. You just can't ask the citizens, so what is it that mm -hmm. we should do? Mm -hmm. Look, it's, it is a mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. And now, uh, and I think that the consequence was that after having these um, uh, questions, we then organized these kind of discussion groups with uh, researchers and stakeholders to actually sort of go into so, um, how these questions could further be developed into real research programs. And now we are at a point where we, and this is more like a personal statement, we are at the risk that this is becoming something like the holy grail. So that it is the citizens that should actually define the questions and that it's actually the policy makers should now actually see whether or not the questions are being asked in four years' time. And of course they're not. So the process, I think, is the most important thing which, that you, we should remember from the Dutch um, uh, example, is the, the process is the thing that we might want to uh, uh, emulate also at the European level, but we need to be careful to actually at a certain point in time to stop so actually look back and do the research. Okay. Anybody else who's got a, a, a story, a case study, an example, or a, yes, the lady here, or you've got somebody behind you, thank you. Got, you're sitting in the same place as yesterday, or maybe one row different, aren't you? See, I exactly. see that. Exactly, have a good memory. Yeah, okay. So regarding actually the Dutch example, I mean, we're here from the Netherlands, and I mean, I would just like to clarify that the national agenda was not only actually made by citizens, but also by academics. So academics were also consolidated. And for example, the reason why, I mean, I'm really glad you mentioned the example of the earthquakes, because we're actually from Groningen, where actually all the earthquakes are actually happening, and no one really cares about what's happening there. But the thing is, I think the risk um, of actually asking citizens to participate in such, a, in such agendas um, is that also that um, less attention will be paid
relate to basic science and some of the questions which are also relevant. So I think it's a good point that we actually like bring that example, but I'm not sure that actually is a solution. I was wondering whether we actually shouldn't like bring the discussion a little bit more to a little bit a few steps before. So again, education and starting a little bit earlier because once we actually like take it to the level of academic research, I think having the input of academics themselves is really important, which is exactly what the Dutch did. And um, I think if we really want to involve general citizens, most citizens, I think we really have to involve really everyone. And in the case of just agenda, I think it was not a coincidence that the earthquake question was actually brought up. It was brought up by citizens that were really unhappy. And that's all really like uh, one another like occasion to actually bring the discussion because no one was really listening to them. So I, I again, I mean, maybe I wasn't very clear, but I think the- Okay, well, let me just, let me just go back and pick up on something. So, so I see you sort of said, um, I think also perhaps the engagement, and you talked about stopping the process and going and getting into the research at a certain point, and the engagement is also how you engage. I mean, you know, the, city, the, the, the person, us, our role, is how you engage. And, yeah. and, and, and let's get away from the binary notions of, of, of just a, a yes or a no, or I want, you know, it needs to be broad. That's a whole management of conversation. But just very specifically, you just said, I don't think that's the process. That it needs to be an education. So if we're bringing them into the R&I process, if we're bringing them into which might you know, impact on policy making, it needs to be, be very specific. What do you mean by that, for example? I, I mean that, for example, like, I think that someone already said that before, but I, I do think that education starts a little bit earlier. For example, in Belgium, they start teaching, like, the constitution in um, high school, which is something that, honestly, I don't think no one is really doing that in America. People love the constitution, and even though they don't know how to interpret it, they actually have even apps with it. And I really think we should like bring it a little bit that, like translate things and also like- Slow down, slow down, sorry, oh, you're sorry. so speedy. Just be clear, yes, so we I should- I do think we should actually should talk more about democracy already like at, at high school level, basically. Okay. And it's something that it's not really like really happening. A civic education starts basically too late. Okay. And that means not only civic education when it comes to like local democracy, but also like the interaction between uh, citizens and the EU, because I think most my, most of my students, when they come to law school, they really have um, a wrong perception of democracy and of the EU. Okay, all right. Let's just park. Thank you. Can we just park that a second and see if there's anything that's come in on social media apart from your own question, Kimberly? More <laughs> questions. <laughs> No. So just to, to, to pick up on some, of the, on some of what's been said, I throw it back because, you know, you, you are the researchers or a large number of people in this room are the researchers. We're looking at this critical point you made about how you articulate all of these points into questions. We looked at having flexibility and the need for flexibility. And we looked at, if you get the citizens in the process, at some point grouping because, you know, there was a thought, well, it was a bit mad, some of the world. You know, they weren't practical, so how do you group them? Who else has got some thoughts on what's the relevant knowledge? You know, picking up, what's the relevant knowledge? And or, I throw to you into the panel, given the speed at which things are evolving, given the speed of digitization, given the speed of stuff that's coming up, autonomous cars, given the speed of the sharing economy, how does relevant knowledge also fit into that framework? How does it keep up? How do we get that flexibility with all this change? Uh, the Commission uh, made a selection of uh, 17 researchers from different fields, only one from social science. And I was chairing this group in order to create new methodologies for getting the relevance of the different subjects of research for people, for citizens, and also the social impact. And they make us uh, uh, three characteristics. Should be democratic to get the citizens that traditionally are non participants. The second is uh, analyze change because the priorities of people change very quickly. And the third one, cheap. Mm -hmm. And we got some, uh, one of them uh, on relevance, and the document is already finished, is. Uh, for instance, making algorithms for analyzing Twitter, Twitter analytics, Facebook analytics, and so on. Uh, when we create the algorithm, we can check very quickly, cheap, every day, how the priorities of people are changing. 
eh, when we compare this with traditional um, public consultation surveys, eh, we feel that we are adding eh, democracy because people that do not care even about our research, eh, they are writing tweets every day, and so we can analyze uh, that. The other that is still more interesting, in my opinion, is uh, about social impact. Social link. Social okay. impact. 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 Yep. Mm -hmm. So, uh, a social impact open repository, free, eh, non-profit, has been created, and the researchers are uh, delivering there. The evidence they have about the social impact of the, the research is not only of social science and humanities, it's of all science. And there are evaluated and published. But, then instruments like Wikipedia, for instance, Wikipedia, is including those evidence in the uh, different uh, pages they, they make. That means, for instance, if you look, if you are a citizen that has, you are worrying about corruption mm -hmm, and uh, you do not care about research, you go to Wikipedia to corruption. And you can see there how one FP7, which name is Alax, has uh, provided eh, with some uh, uh, action that uh, is very efficient in not only increasing the nonsense about corruption, but also getting the implication in institutions that people that usually rejected uh, them. So you go to Wikipedia not because you care about research, but you care about corruption, but in corruption eh, you have this reference to the social impact uh, repository and to this uh, FP7 uh, project. But is the two ways around in relation citizens, policy makers and researchers because when you see this in Wikipedia, you can be in favor of that or you can disagree. And if you disagree, we can mention in Wikipedia that this kind of action in your case has not been valid, for instance. So that means that citizens can participate in the evaluation of the social impact of our research. And policy makers have, even in Wikipedia, when they care about one social problem, they can find there those researches that have provided a solution for this problem. Mm -hmm. okay. Did you want to? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Uh, a sort of general answer to everybody, something that I've just noticed, and there are a few people here who were recently, about 10 days ago in Brussels, at the meeting of Science Europe that also discussed the Lamy report. And they are national funders, if anybody doesn't know that, but I think everybody does. They were interested, how do you define missions, etc. But nobody mentioned education, citizen science, etc. And as soon as you speak to a different audience, different parts of this sort of come up as major issues. And this is why the Lamy group is doing its what I call missionary work. We've been running around to all kinds of meetings in order to, because of course, you know, this is a very thin report, written in simple language, which I think is a first for a commission published document. Uh, uh, but I would like to go, the reason why I mentioned this, um, yesterday at the very beginning, in the first session, I, we got the definition of democracy as being a form of coordination. I would add, it's also, a form of cooperation and a form of communication. If you yeah, get these okay. three element, uh, elements in science mm -hmm. and research and the decisions made about this coordination, cooperation and communication, you're on the right track. So the whole thing could be very, very democratic for the guys who do democracy. You see, I, saw, I said I wasn't an expert. By the time we finish this, I probably will be, but okay. Anyone? Comment? Question? Example? Yes, gentleman here. Your hand shot up with aplomb there. Thank you. Yeah, you stand as you uh, as long as we can. Can we hear you? Yeah, no, shout. Yeah, shout. Do shout and uh, tell us who you are. Can you? Sorry, can you go back a step and just say who you are?
Yes, of very good point. Yes, they are. I know. We, we tend to, in these echo chats, silo down even in these. You're absolutely right. They are. We all are. Politicians are citizens. We all are. Yes. Uh, I don't see excellence as it's a sort of overreaching thing throughout the report. It's not under a question mark anywhere. It's a sort of really overreaching thing. As far as the impact is concerned, we focused very much on the missions the way we see them at the moment. The, you have to keep one thing in mind, the Commission will be developing this. And I'm very glad that we will exist for a certain time longer to sort of, you know, keep the basic concept of what this is going and etc. And if I may be very blunt, they still need us. Uh, so that's a good reason for keeping us. And as for the impact, there will be missions but there will also be collaborative traditional research that has been around for, uh, for I don't know which framework it started, number one or whatever. Uh, so with the missions, it's where we want to get the difference. The fact that a mission may be a fluke, that you don't get any impact because there are no results, but people have to, this, is, this was what we tried to uh, articulate as best we could and how much we could. You can start a mission, and this is the flexibility that we started off from. Uh, and it can be a great idea, everybody can be enamored with it, but in the end it sort of, you know, peters out. In the end you don't get very much for some reason. There have been examples of this, but this would not be penalized. Otherwise, if you penalize this, of course you cannot get impact if it's, you know, a big no. Uh, uh, but uh, the joke is that if you want high-risk questions, things that will move European research, and I'm thinking about the global dimension as well forward, you have to take a risk. And the same applies to SSH. The only reason why I, if I may say, I insisted on the SSH being prominently mentioned in the report was the unfortunate foster child syndrome that we have been living under through many framework programs, including Horizon. In Horizon, we were a late add-on, and I stress late. This is why the German colleagues question, it, it was too late to do real multidisciplinary stuff in the, in the other challenges, too late. Because if you really want to get true multidisciplinarity, you have to have the SSH crowd on board from day one. It's the articulation of the questions which we as, uh, you know, different scientists from different uh, areas, this is key and this is what we missed out in Horizon for the simple reason it was too late. Just out, out of, can I, yeah, um, just out of interest, can I come, come back to you because Forgive me if I didn't catch it correctly. You were saying that you were with Science Europe and you were saying it was interesting that it was they were they were hearing new things that some of these basics They were, they were yes, focused on different parts different of the, part, yeah. different parts of okay. the report. What we're getting okay. here yeah. is different questions and different points of stress, which is normal. Mm -hmm. And this is why uh, some of us in the Lamy group especially uh, are doing this missionary work. And we are very much supported by com the commission in this because number one, we, it's not promoting this, it's getting feedback from you people. Mm -hmm. And the feedback that we have been getting from very different stakeholders, because it's different if you're a major national funder like the DFG in Germany or I don't know, the NWO in the Netherlands. And if you're a researcher uh, uh, sitting here in this audience worrying about democracy or something. So, you know, the view of these things is completely different. Mm -hmm. And we will be having our first big meeting because of course we correspond uh, in different ways on January the 11th. And uh, in the meantime, and this I stress again, uh, we've been flooded with comments, uh, and they started off, uh, to go back to you, with the SSH community. First of all, it started off like this. Uh, you know, the, the first reactions were, why is SSH important? If this hadn't been absolved, we would, would not be in the report, especially not the way it's articulated. Because here, it explicitly says that SSH can lead missions, but also be integrated into other missions, etc. 
And then it stopped, thank God. Uh, uh, and now we are, because you know, people said, well, why are they, they writing this? We've been through this. Mm -hmm. uh, before, when the consultations were open for the Lamy report, a ton of stuff came in. I myself wrote over 30 pages, I think, at least. They were called one pages, by the way. Uh, 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 at least 30 pages, which I've promised myself to publish one day. Uh, of you know how do you make other domains of research understand why it is important to have SSH re researchers there from the very beginning and you have to be very concrete and you have to give excellent examples for them to catch on mm -hmm. and uh, and the Lamy group is comprised not just of researchers in fact Jean-Pierre Bourguignon told me do you realize you're the only researcher there uh, all of them, well not all of them, part of them had been researchers in their early days, so to speak, at the beginning of their careers, but they have gone on to other things. We had people from industry, from all kinds of, you know. So we are a very diverse group. And unbelievably, like I mentioned last night uh, uh, to somebody at the cocktail party, uh, you know, the first time we met, I thought, oh my God, how is this gonna work? You know, when everybody, we did a tour of the Dawa. Mm -hmm. And it worked. Uh, you know, there was a good synergy. Uh, we started, the things that I didn't know I asked, these guys asked me about SSH and, you know, research related topics. And, uh, but I would like to stress this. Uh, uh, I think it is a right step in this, you know, in the sense of democracy, of asking people from the commission asked, con I mean, being very concrete. Uh, Commissioner Moedas asked, that this group be formed. It was like a brainstorming thing, based on data, of course, that were provided by, well, that was provided by the uh, commission, etc. Uh, uh, and it's here, but it's a trigger for what is going to be articulated okay. until June. Mm -hmm. And don't think I'm, uh, what's the right word, that I sleep uh, peacefully. I never sleep peacefully. Uh, uh, until we see the first draft of FP9, I won't sleep peacefully. Uh, uh, because you never know uh, what can happen along the way. And uh, we have to be uh, uh, very vigilant about this, all of us. I'm speaking to the researchers primarily because things can go wrong. And this is why I mentioned ESOF, because at ESOF, uh, Robert Jan Smits has asked for, I don't know whether it's whole morning or whole afternoon, when there's going to be an open discussion on the first draft of FP9. And I think it's important that the SSH community is represented there in not just the numbers, but you know, for once that we get a representative group of people who can, uh, uh, with Meritim, if I may say, comment on whatever's coming. Okay. okay, so this is it. Can I? Okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I just want to throw it just, I know you have a question, but just for a second, because I want to see, I'm still just trying to put it back out there before, before we close, just to, 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 to pick up on, because the question really is, you know, what, we, coming back to the question, what knowledge, you know, do we need to shape democracies in the future? You put these key areas, what you had also picked up from these conversations. You talked about the, some of these points that you put on the table about some of these elements, education, language, citizen science. How do we shape them? Democracy is a mission. Do any of, any of you have some ideas on, on this? Any thoughts of what those missions could be? What could be in there? Um, is it way too early a stage to even ask you, ask you this question? Yes. Thank you. Yeah, you need a microphone, my dear. Yeah, thank you. So, um, I totally agree with your uh, missionary plan for, for uh, social sciences and the humanities. But uh, I do have a question. And I have a question for Ramon and for Emilena as well. And do, don't you see a tension between excellence and impact? Don't you see a tension between free science, free knowledge, and, uh, and uh, politics-driven uh, knowledge and science. Because uh, I can see a risk uh, for philosophy and um, because we will have just uh, applied philosophy 
And um, you know, we, we already have some problem with the multi multidisciplinarity because at the multidisciplinarity and the interdisciplinarity, because at the European level, this is a very valuable uh, asset to have uh, interdisciplinarity. But if you see then at the national level, and if you consider this at the level of career, career level, then you have a lot of problem because you are, uh, we are not acknowledged in your interdisciplinarity um, skills. And you have a problem in publishing. If you work with the, uh, lawyers, then you have a problem to find a journal which is interesting for both, for philosophers and for lawyers as well. So, so okay. So do you want to shape your yeah? Let Ramon answer first. Yes, of course. I'm going to I'm going to answer yeah, to both questions in the same answer. What uh, knowledge is relevant mm? uh, if the knowledge we create has social impact? and citizens see that is good for them, the policy makers will take it. The, the better way is not going with our research to policy makers, but to citizens. And the citizens go to policy makers eh, to eh, apply them. Just one example, included on education, taking Milena sense, has created successful actions in education that are totally overcoming early school living and inequalities of outcomes. Uh, in this project, there were uh, 16 European countries. Portugal was not in it. But no problem. The successful actions have been applied in different countries, European countries. Portugal has known the results and now the Minister of Education of Portugal is uh, creating a plan to implement the successful actions of this project. If the research team came to the government of Portugal, probably nothing uh, resulted. In what about philosophy, arts and so on? In the evaluation of social impact, we are creating intangible indicators, for instance the knowledge of philosophy. If this increments the knowledge of regular people, not of philosophers or sociologists, but of regular people, this is social impact. Social impact is not only to have health or to have no, but also in art. Eh? We have developed a lot of art. The pleasure no? to see a picture. Eh? Also we have indicators if we have evaluated this pleasure. And if one family see one museum, visit one museum, and the mother or the father explain to the children how change, how this change the cultural relations of this family. And we have indicators to do that. If we do a very well developed set of indicators, this problem is not bad. We know that the dominant discourse calculates social impact only like economic impact, homo economicus, and so on. We should enter this and to discuss what are the indicators. Okay. Thank you. Uh, it's interesting, you say if citizens see what is good for them, who and how do they decide what is good? Because what is good for one person if is not you, good for another. If you open the research to their participation, and they implement in their context, in their families, schools, and jobs, the actions, no? the solutions no? mm -hmm. you found in the research. If they apply them and feel better, for instance, children that were almost 100% of this school, they were to, 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 to early school living, and now they have the same results at the upper class, private schools, mm -hmm. the family see that this is good for them. Mm -hmm. And they ask the policy makers mm, to apply the results of this research. Mm -hmm. If we go directly to the policy makers, many times they will think that we are selling our product. Mm -hmm. But when mm -hmm. citizens go, it's a different approach. Okay, thank you. Yes, Milena. Uh, to go back to the first part of your question, don't worry about the philosophers. You guys are coming back in with, uh, you know, flying colors. I'm not joking. 
uh, because it, it was the philosophers a long time ago. I'll give you two names. You will know them. One is German, whom I mention, and you know I'm a great fan of his. He's, although he's 80, I don't know what at the moment, he still sends me his papers on a regular basis. Jürgen Mittelstrass, who introduced the notion of orientational knowledge, knowledge towards the society, not knowledge as hardcore facts. And he did this in the early 70s, not the bene. Mm -hmm. And the other guy is uh, both a friend of mine now, so you see, linguists and neuroscientists work well with philosophers. And uh, the other person I want to mention by name is Robert or Bob, as we called him, Freudman, an American, who has, he, uh, he edited the big, uh, uh, what is it, handbook on interdisciplinarity and in inverted commas that was published by Cambridge University Press a couple of years ago. And his definition of transdisciplinarity, and even further than multidisciplinarity, is something that should, I think everybody here should have a look at it. And he's a great speaker, among other things. I usually invite him to my multidisciplinary events, so to speak. But if, if you remember when I started, I, I particularly stressed the changing of mindsets, but it is happening. And I, uh, uh, it's a slow process. And last year, I, was, yes, uh, I'm sorry, I have very bad time coordinates in my head. Uh, last year at the University of Shanghai, there was um, a very, it was the Chinese who triggered this off. Uh, uh, and I would say a recap of the old C.P. Snow, the two cultures thing, you know, whether you had science and culture at university. And I gave one of the keynotes there, and this is going to be published in, what is it called, Science Review in a couple of months now, where I literally suggest that integrative bioethics in the sense of middle trust and all of the, you know, a lot more people, not just these two, be taught at undergraduate level as a compulsory course so that the notion of what is knowledge, to go back mm -hmm. to the initial question, becomes a many-layered phenomena and not doing just molecular biology, or I don't know what, doesn't matter what. It's about, I think, 15 different kinds of physics floating around at the moment. It's, if I may call it that, and I think that you will understand what I'm, everybody will. Um, when you look at how knowledge w developed, so to speak, over many, many thousands of years, uh, you know, Plato, and just, I'll, I'll just use the big name so that it's transparent. Uh, we had Plato, a very holistic vision of knowledge. Then we came to Aristotle, the first divisions into physics and metaphysics, and then it started. And then you had physics, now we have 15 different kinds of physics, etc. And what is, what, the way I see it, but this is not the Lemurie report, it's me. It's a kind of return to Plato, that you need the sense of it. You have to be excellent in whatever discipline you do. It doesn't matter what it is. I was a good linguist, believe me, before I went into neuroscience. But, uh, 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 but you have to be. But then you have to have this capacity of embracing, I would say, other kinds of knowledges. Mm -hmm. And Philip Campbell, who is the, direct, uh, who's the editor in chief of uh, what's it called, Nature, and I gave a talk in uh, the Austrian Alps not long ago, where our vision, it's still a vision, is that one day, and I hope I'm around to see it, scientists, and I say the word scientists, will not be evaluated exclusively on hardcore bibliometric whatever mm -hmm. data that you can get, but as a whole. In other words, this problem of where the young kids publish, etc., should and it's happening already, I warn you, it's already happening, will, I hope, in a relatively sh short space of time, start disappearing very seriously. Okay, thank you. I'm getting some signals, but I don't know if it's I'm aware of time for one. Yeah. Great. Okay. Yeah, do you want to just shape? We're, we've got, we're 10 to 1, so do you want to just pick... Just to two, as you like, but perhaps not to everybody if you can. Just perhaps one to one person and another to another person could be good. Could be helpful. Sure. So one that's come up 
How do you suggest, and I'll pose this, say, to Ramon. How do you suggest to explain to researchers? No, I think this should actually go to Milena. <laughs> How do you suggest to explain to researchers the importance of the SSH aspects? Do you think that the obligation at the, the proposal stage would be the right time for them to learn about it? Okay, and another, let's hear some others. Yes. Uh, thank you. One second. And this I'll give to Ramon. Why do you think there is such a big gap between SSH researchers and other researchers? Okay. Okay. All right, let's deal with those. Ramon, can you start us off? Why is there such a big gap between those two, those SSH and the other? Well, I, I think there are uh, two main two main reasons. Mm -hmm. The one eh, that uh, also, eh, thank you for mentioning Philip, eh, Philip Graudren, eh, that has been so, so important in this. No? Eh, one of the reasons is because eh, some policy makers and some citizens no, do not, uh, are not able to see no, how we have contributed no, to the present society in the last two centuries, no? eh, since uh, social sciences were created or humanities still before that. No? And uh, they are not able to, 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 to see that. We need to explain them. No? But the other reason I think, and this is uh, a criticism to us, no? we have not cared about that. Eh? We have not cared about creating the excellent research, excellent no? intellectual developments, you have no care about uh, looking at what are the benefits for citizens, for society of this, no? and to explain citizens, and to explain policymakers these benefits. But I think now it, this is being resolved. No? And we are being asked by citizens, by our universities also, and by the calls of research, to explain and to uh, make explicit and visible these uh, benefits we have created for Soros society. No? So I think this is the problem that we are resolving, eh? this problem at uh, this uh, moment. And the consequence is that uh, other no, fields of science no, that uh, do not, it's not that they do not feel that we are no importance, but they feel that we are not properly scientific persons, no? that we have opinions. No? Mm -hmm. uh, they think that it's very important democracy, yeah? and we should develop democracy, but they think that if each of us say a different thing about democracy. Mm -hmm. And uh, in another, uh, another time, I am going to be critical with us. Many times we replace serious research, for instance, about democracy with our ideology. Mm? We are citizens, we are also politic persons. Mm -hmm. But when we are researchers, we should talk about the evidence about democracy. Mm? Not to explain my ideological opinion mm? as if this was social science. This is not social science, this is my personal opinion. So sometimes we had contributed to this. And if we are three, we explain many, very different things. And if we evaluate one project on democracy, mm, yeah. the difference of our qualifications is oh. very big. Yeah. So we yeah. should care about providing, about democracy that is very serious, evidence. Mm -hmm. Evidence about how to make a better democracy, mm -hmm. and in my opinion, solutions about how to do that. Thank you. Very, very valuable. I think very valuable point there. I saw some no nodding. And I think uh, also what you say, you know, you've got to be very careful, particularly if we're looking at, at what we're going to do as a mission around democracy, if that is what it will be. How do we not get our own ideology? We are scientists. So how do we keep that out of it in that domain? Um, so finally, if I can ask you, Milena, how to explain to researchers how and when the importance of the SSH aspect? Is it a proposal stage, another stage? No, no, no. It's been going on for a very long time. There have been so many conferences, uh, so many events, but I will tell you my personal view on this. 
you get people together in a face-to-face -face environment, especially early career researchers. Uh, and I did this one thing that has, now I have proof that it worked, because, you know, evidence, hardcore. Uh, in 2012, I organized, uh, at that time I was chair, what was it called, chair of the standing committee for the humanities of the now non-existing ESF. And uh, uh, I organized an event with the topic water. Nothing else, water, you know, simple. Uh, where we got 37, and they were selected according to their, you know, uh, a tribute, so to speak, and, I, and we hold them up in Stresa, Italy. Beautiful environment, but it takes two and a half hours by car to get to Milan, so there were no, you know, here it would be a bit more difficult in Lisbon, I think, to or do this. It was like a military operation. For every meal, the seating arrangements were changed, and we had young early career researchers from all domains of science. The first day, they, you know, they sort of kept away from each other. If, you know, I don't know, the economists from the engineers and the engineers from the mathematicians and the guys from physics, etc. By the end of the week, when I thought I was, I was going to die, how tired I was, because 37 young people really tire you out. Uh, 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 what happened was they have a journal that they activated on interdisciplinarity with water as a subject. It's still going. And a conference I organized in Stockholm under the auspices of Academia Europea uh, this in May. One of the participants of this event gave statistics, fresh statistics now. 75% of the kids who attended this event do multidisciplinary research. And when asked whether they would have done it uh, on their own, they said, no, you have to get people together. You have to communicate. That's what the point that I made. You have to get your math messages across. And if I have one more minute, we have the head engineer who uh, constructed and, uh, uh, you know, who was the driving force behind, uh, uh, what is it called, the sewerage system in Istanbul. Now, you can imagine how you know, complicated that one was. And he gave a great keynote, etc. And then one of my kids put up her hand. She was an archaeologist from Cambridge. She got a little stick out, rushed to the computer, and showed how in ancient Rome, some of the solutions were for storage systems were even more, I would say, uh, advanced than the stuff that he showed us for Istanbul uh, in 2012. So, you know, this, he was shocked. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is another question for a very serious question. Why do we lose knowledge? You know, what, what mechanism do, why does it happen? Mm -hmm. Not everywhere in the world, by the way. Mm -hmm. The Chinese still have a good way of preserving it, but okay. Okay, you tell me, it's your lead, whether I, it's one, and we're gonna hear final speech, whether I close, whether there's something you feel hasn't been addressed. I, from what's come in. Anything else from the house? From inside? Yes, okay, well, we, well, well, just wait for a mic a second, please. Please, really nice and just get to the thrust. If it's a question, if it's a comment, nice and concise. Uh, and just shout if it doesn't work. Just speak up nice and loud.
So. Okay. If you want to make a last comeback, you may, but just one, one, one from the panel, if I might kindly ask, please. Yeah, Ramon, go on. Thank you. Uh, well, uh, from this project I mentioned, included uh, the schools have been transforming, totally transforming uh, since uh, early ages. And uh, even the families and the citizens go into the classroom and work together with the teacher. You know? and they are overcoming uh, any limits of the school. So we have already the knowledge that uh, enable us to do what you are uh, willing to do. And, and we know how to do that. Uh, this is published, it's published in Springer, for instance, the conclusions of the project. Springer, the, the main, uh, is, is published in Cambridge Journal of Education, in, 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 Harvard Educational Review, so we, we, we know how to overcome this no? yeah. from researchers and citizens. No? Okay. Was there something fundamental? You, no, you're good. I'm going to, if I have your blessing, I'm going to, because I can read the energy in the room and people have planes and trains and lunch to, to, to get to. So if that is okay, I'm going to close down this discussion because I know we've just got one last very quick speaker, so I want people to be here for that. But please, for all their fabulous brains and really interesting comments and for trying to respond directly to what came in. I appreciate it very much. Can you please give a warm round of applause to our last three speakers? Um, and you are all at liberty. And I, and I didn't even say the fantastic things, but I think one of the key, key, key things that came out exactly this, what the notion of what is knowledge is critical, absolutely critical, and a very, very key point that came out of that for me. But you may all take your seats. We've got another five or six minutes, and you are all released for lunch. So thank you very much. Um, we need to, oh, we need to see the Slido, don't we? I, I nearly forgot. Okay, so there we go. That's uh... <laughs> who said law? Who said law? Was it somebody in the house? They left. You said law. Anyone else say law? You are the three percent. Who said ICT? ICT, ICT, not education. Interestingly, from your last question, you were ICT, the lady who asked the last question. Okay, so um, the end is in sight. Um, I just, the only thing I need to say to you, just, just from a, um, sorry, a uh, housekeeping point of view, is please uh, do your best to put the evaluation forms uh, in, I think there's a box on your way out, please do that. Um, but before you do leave, and I thank everybody, could you put your, exercise your arm muscles one last time, because I would like to invite to the stage Angela Schindel Daniels of the Net for Society Advisory Board. She's also a former program committee member and SSH NCP. So where are you? Where am I? There. Ah, I thought you were going to be sitting there. I think you're going to say some very helpful and coherent last words for these good people before I take our leave of them. Hello. I always welcome people with a handshake, with a very British handshake. There you go. No? There you okay. go, yeah. When you stay okay. close and... Is this better? Yes. Okay. We spent the last two days in a very fruitful discussion on democracy, what it means, how it's in jeopardy, how to enhance it, how to safeguard it, but also how to move this issue forward in the context of research. The issue of democracy was an issue, the last project of Philippe Caudron. Um, he's been sort of omnipresent in this conference. Um, I hope that most of you know him, but I'm sure a lot of you have only been confronted with some of the uh, consequences of his actions, and you may not even know that he's behind them. 
Philip was the acting head of Unit B6, and he was a great supporter and promoter of Nets for, Soci for Society in all of his activities. And this is why it is important to, the, to Net for Society, to the advisory board, and to others who have worked in other capacities with Philip to just take a brief moment at the end of this conference to pay tribute to Philip today. Philip's life and work has greatly affected many of us in a most quiet and yet profound and lasting way. Philip was an extraordinary, greatly respected official of RTD but not because of the position he held, but rather because of the kind, principled, and humane manner in which he engaged with people, especially those people who were buying the issues, such as democracy, that he was so committed to, issues that aimed to make the world a better place. He was someone who not only talked, but listened, and he was engaged, authentically engaged, and this is actually the one word seeking, if one seeks just to find that one word to characterize him, that is what he describes Philip and his view of the world. The fortitude of his character led to an engagement that had and continues to have impact on an entire community. And I think you can really see in the presence of this conference how often he was referred to in many of the different interventions we had in the last two days. And for so many of us in the world of EU research and politics, he was an extremely intelligent, understanding, sympathetic, witty, caring face of a huge organization that often seems impersonal and impenetrable. He became a friend of many of us, quite a few of them actually sitting here today, but also to many others who never met him simply because his efforts and commitment made new things possible. He was keenly aware of the fact that true engagement often comes with the price tag and he was willing to pay it. In all of his endeavors, he did not resort to the black and white. He lived his life in color, which he gave expression to in many subtle, unconventional ways. He was always the man with the bow tie. He remained engaged to the very end, including in this, the preparation of this conference. And we, his colleagues and friends, who worked with him so intensely in various capacities over so many years, if not decades, want to thank Philip today at this conference for his tireless dedication, relent, relentless encouragement, and his courage. He left us on September 9th, unprepared and bereaved, but also inspired and determined. Courage must not always war. Often the quiet voices are the most profound. We thank Philip for his voice. We will carry on with his voice in his ears, in our ears. He is fiercely missed. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think uh, he would be extremely pleased. You used some spectacularly lovely words to describe that gentleman. I didn't know him. so, And I love the uh, authentically engaged. That's a very, very nice compliment to give somebody. So thank you for that. And very important. You're absolutely right. He has been omnipresent. He's been mentioned many times uh, yesterday and today. So um, let me just do what I need to do at the very end, which is, of course, to thank everybody in the whole world and my grandmother. So I thank net for society It's been a lot of hard work. You think, oh, there's 100, 120, and 70, 80, 90 come. It's a lot of hard work getting you all here and getting all of the speakers and getting everybody on the same page. So can we just have a, an applause? I don't even know if they're in the room, but let's please um, thank very much. It's a lot of work. I thank also the FCT, the Portuguese National Funding Agency for Science, Research and Technology. I thank very much the Portuguese organising team. Marissa, I think, has been an absolute star in terms of zipping emails off in every direction and organising everybody and their own grandmothers. Um, I thank the technicians here at the pavilion and I do thank the social media curator. You're a star. I really love that. I'm going to ask next time whoever is the social media curator, could you also read out your own question that you've curated yourself. I love that idea. Thank you to the photographer for trying to get us all to look happy, but I think we were. And uh, 
big, big, big thanks to all the wonderful speakers. It is insane. You have huge brains, and I just keep having to say, brevity, concise, and it must be a pain in the bum for you, but I really do very much appreciate your playing ball on that front. And thanks to all of your good selves here in the room and those of you who joined and stayed online. Not everybody turns up for stuff these days, and so it's uh, really hugely appreciated that you did and that you remained uh, authentically engaged. I'm going to use that one. So thank you for helping to generate the interesting discussions. I hope you go away with plenty of nuggets of wisdom. As Katarzyna said, we need to get it out there. It can't just be an echo chamber. We need to be the best multipliers. So. Go forth and multiply and chat in pubs, at dinner parties, in car journeys, with your family, wherever, with your fellow researchers who aren't here, of all disciplines. I wish you very much luck, very much rigor. Be interesting to see what happens next year. Melena said, get your bloody skates on. So uh, be interesting to see what happens next year. So I wish you luck with that. And I also wish you all a very safe trip home. Thank you very much for being here. Thanks. Thank <laughs> you.